Děkuji. No. No. <laughs> So good morning, everybody, and welcome back to the second day of our conference, Memory of the Past and uh, Politics of the Present. My name is Markus Pieper. I'm from Dresden, and I have the honor to moderate our panel this morning. Um, we started yesterday with a variety of perspectives from different European countries, from Poland, Germany, France, the Ukraine, of course, the Czech Republic, Finland, and Estonia, and we go on in the same way, having I think it's another dozen countries that we have a look to all the time um, on the way of finding an answer to the question if our national narratives, our historical narratives are somehow connected to today's politics concerning uh, the Russian war against the Ukraine. So we have today four new participants here on, on the stage from the Russian Federation, the Czech Republic, from Germany and Austria. I will introduce them one after the other. So we will have four very interesting uh, presentations now, starting with the Czech Republic, Maria Czerna, um, uh, is uh, next to me. She's a researcher in the Institute uh, for Contemporary History here in Prague, who is uh, the main organizer of, uh, of this wonderful conference. She focuses in her work on the Czech history after 1945 and recently published um, an important book dealing with the political, uh, economic and social aspects of the presence of the Soviet army, not in the Ukraine, but here in Czechoslovakia, or today's Czech Republic, after 1968. Uh, the name of the book is Soviet Army and Czech Society, 
1968 to 1991. It is published now in Czech, and if I'm well informed, it will be uh, in English. It's being translated. Uh -huh. So it's being translated and will be uh, soon in English on the market as well. And I have found one interesting, one interesting publication in your long list of publications you have, because Maria Czerna um, cooperated as well in various uh, software applications that were interesting about liberty after 1945, and this is another one about the assassination on Heydrich, I suppose, in 1942. This would be interesting to discuss, but uh, today's subject uh, is a different one. So uh, we are really happy to hear your presentation now, Maria. Uh, the title is The Utilization of Historical Memory in the Contemporary Czech Pro-Russian Activism. So, thank you. So, good morning, uh, and <clears throat> thank you for, for the invitation, for the presentation. Um, I've been recently interested in, in the way how um, the legacy of the Great Patriotic War is used as a source of uh, legitimacy for pro-Soviet activism, uh, pro-Russian activism, sorry, in, in the Czech Republic. And, but previously, I, my intention was to include into my presentation more historical moments, uh, which are also interesting, for example, like uh, uh, invasion in 68, which is also, uh, in, in a way, uh, treated specifically by this sort of people in these pro-Russian circles. But as I started to, to prepare my presentation, I realized that I'm not able to squeeze more uh, more uh, events into 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 it. So I just focus on on the Great Patriotic War. So maybe if we can tackle it, it uh, during the the conversation, we can leave it for 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 it. <clears throat> the the obsession with the Great Patriotic War. This can be observed in, in the contemporary Russia, and that we will hear about it uh, later in, in this panel is well known, especially after 2014 and the t today wars against the whole Ukraine, when the Russian aggression has been justified as a prolongation of the war against fascism. Uh, we have a, a photo here. Uh, this is from from um, a song, "Donbas is behind us," which is some propagandistic song made by, by a Russian in, in Donbas, and where we can see blurring of uh, various contexts, which is very common in, in, in this approach to the Great Patriotic War, and. We, we, we see uh, the, the contemporary Russian uh, militia men who is meeting with, in, from Donbas, who is meeting with, with Soviet Red Army soldiers. And such a, such a blurring of various uh, spatial and hence historical contexts allows, allows uh, to Russia you, to use the legacy of the Great Patriotic War as an argument, tool or weapon for contemporary purposes. Thus, remembering the war and paying tribute to the historical merits of Soviet unions and uh, Red Army has much more to do with the, with the present. And that is why the spreading of the Russian world, which uh, we are witnessing now abroad, that comprise complex variety of activities like cultural, linguistic, economic, political, and even espionage, espionage, goes always hand in hand with manifested reverence to Soviet soldiers and Red Army merits and martyrs. And this is also valid for the Czech Republic. The, this vision of a Russian world as a transnational community is, of course, first and foremost matter of Russian, Russian diaspora and Russian compatriots. 
uh, and indeed international expatriate structures maintaining contacts with Russian state via Rasotrudchestvo and Russian embassies started to emerge in the beginning of the millennium and the, uh, and also, in, in a little bit later, in Czech Republic too, the Coordinating Council of Russian Compatriots in the Czech Republic as a roof platform for various R Russian clubs and associations who were willing to co collaborate, cooperate with the Russian embassy was established in 2008 and soon has uh, been mobilized around the official memory of the Great Patriotic War. Uh, it focused, uh, their interest focused primarily on the more or less traditional ceremonies, as you can see, the celebrating of, of the Victory Day, laying wreath and flowers on the graves of the Soviet soldiers, and cleaning and repairing uh, graves, uh, and um, uh, you can see Subotnik is a voluntary uh, work, works at the, at the cemeteries. And this sort of activities, which could look like like coming like grassroots, were, were promoted by the Russian community press and by embassy and etc. And were connected with various official officialities of, of Russian embassy as well. And also we can see some new traditional like, like distribution of Saint Ribbon, Saint George Ribbon etc. Uh, special attention was also, like in Russia, was paid to the vet veterans of the war and to the, to the Soviet dead. Uh, the, the, you know, this popular, popular searching, so-called searching movement in, in Russia, um, in which groups of volunteers uh, search for the unburied, unburied remains of fallen soldiers, which, which was kind of appropriated by Russian state recently, uh, has some kind of parallel in other countries and in Czech Republic too, although in much more modest, modest level. Still, there are thousands of unknown fallen Soviet soldiers and prisoners of the war this can be identified uh, with some glo and, and, tri and tribute can pay to them uh, can be paid to them and ca they can be glorified <clears throat> and these activities has been all, uh, since around 2010 coordinated by the Russian Ministry of Defense and its representative at the Russian embassy in, in Prague <clears throat> And students of Russian secondary school was first to be asked to help with this uh, identification, identification, identification of uh, Soviet fallen soldiers, but Czech enthusiasts were involved in these networks associated with the Russian embassy too, and they were often awarded and supported by them, as you can see on one of the, this picture. And of, of course, a, a reconstruction of graves and reburial of remains was a good platform for, for uh, official ceremony, for official speeches, uh, uh, and for giving uh, um, opinions about falsi so -called falsification of history, etc. Um, this is one of example of, uh, of a Czech, uh, Czech uh, um, Red, uh, this Red Army Club uh, in Brno, which is kind of special among, among these kind of military clubs uh, and fans of military his, history. Uh, and it has a special pos position and special context with the Russian, Russian embassy and Russian compatriot uh, organization. And it, has, uh, it had status of foreigner even organizer of, of battle reenactment in Eastern Europe and in Russia. And as we know, this is very popular uh, activities uh, in, in Russia as well, these historical reenactments re of, the, of the historical events. And for example, their members are you, you dressed up in the, in the uniform. Um, participate or assist to, to official ceremonies organized by uh, Russian compatriots clubs or, or Russian embassy, etc. Uh, they, are, um, they are also supported by the, the Russian uh, embassy 
for example, the publication of, of books, or uh, they are often awarded. And in 2020, one of the club members received an award from the President Putin himself for her eff efforts to, in personalizing the falling Soviet soldier, soldiers. And her activities were further promoted in the Russian, Russian uh, compatriot press and the Russian media as well. So these people are kind of adopted by, by these this networks and used for, for specific reasons. Um, this club uh, even have a, a teenage section uh, where, where Czech, a lot, uh, for, for, for teenage, where Czech adults playing to Soviet soldiers teach the children how to play to the Soviet soldiers. The Russian emphasize on, on the Soviet contribution to the fight against Nazism has been accelerated since 2014. Uh, Russia, uh, sorry. Uh, Russia activities and aggression in U Ukraine elicited rather critical response in the Czech media and Czech pub uh, political scene and Czech society. And when this provoked a counter-offensive among representatives of, of the Russian world and Russian diaspora, and the, the main purpose was to neutralize, confuse and discredit the criticism by highlighting, highlighting merits of, of Red Army, of Soviet Union, etc., and together with the accusation of the distortion and falsification of history and alleged Russophobia. So, from this time, the disinformation about Ukraine went hand in hand with promoting the cult of the Great Patriotic War. And the new trend was to involve more Czech actors and, and to create the, the network of uh, so-called uh, Russian, Russian friends, which from that time is really being established. And this very various, this is kind of marginal, but very various uh, group uh, or, net, or network of people with various uh, political uh, attitudes, etc. So, and it's quite, uh, there, there, there is a notion from François Storm who calls them a modern commentaire, which is quite uh, fitting to, to also in, in the Czech Republic. And these Czech friends, Czech friends adopted the Russian political agenda, including a defense, defense of the legacy of the Great Patriotic War, mixed with the anti-Ukrainian anti propaganda, wrapped in all-encompassing fight against fascism and falsification of history. Uh, in May, already in May 2014, several manifestations were organized in order to commemorate the Soviet soldiers killed in the Second World War. We can see a, 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 a demonstration near Prague Castle or manifestation ne near Prague Castle and at the same time to support Russia and to protest against alleged Russophobia and lies and alleged lies spread by medias. And the, the same person who organized these uh, mm, this uh, manifestation to honor Soviet soldiers organize demonstration against fa so-called fascism in the, in the Ukraine a little bit later. So it was the main person. And a little bit later, the, the, for example, the, the decision to remove the statue of Marshal Krakow in Prague 6 in 2019 was accompanied by a targeted campaign, campaign that was closely monitored, to say at least, by the Russian embassy and in a, in a, uh, it involved uh, hyperbolic comments and melodramatic gestures, as you can see, of the pro-Russian activist, a um, little bit like in a manner of the bronze soldier affair. And uh, it was uh, associated with aggressive verbal attacks and harassment of the official who were associated with fascists. Um, and these actions was, were dutifully reported to Russia and presented by Russian media as a protest from, from below. Um, of course, yeah, and, and 
Later, after the removal, the pro-Russian activists uh, keep uh, cherish this uh, lieu de mémoire. Uh, <clears throat> the the pro-Russian uh, activist concert in the, uh, with the legacy of, of the Great Patriotic War was expressed by traditional commemorative practice connected celebrating the Victory Day and other important moments of the uh, uh, Second World War. Uh, in an uh, interest with, by veter, uh, in, in paying to veterans, like in Russia, memorials, etc., but also by transmission of modern Russian traditions, like introducing uh, night, uh, night wolves uh, and uh, immortal regiment to the Czech Republic. In two th uh, 2015, uh, the efforts of the Russian embassy to facilitate the victory road of night wolves, wolves through Czech Republic was supported by both Russian compatriots, uh, especially Cossacks, you can hear, you can see here, and the che and a Czech, Czech motorcycle club that, uh, that already enjoyed so-called fraternal links with the Russian night wolves since 2004. Four. So they already were in a personal connection with uh, Zaldostanov, and just they uh, fructified it and, and to, to in the f this this year to help organize the, the, this trip. And then we can see the, the map and the, the preparation. And finally, uh, they they arrived to do, to the uh, graves grave of. Czech, uh, of, of, of Soviet soldiers in, in the Prague cemetery. And although by many people it was pointed uh, to the involvement of the night wolves in Russian aggression in Ukraine, and it was somehow delegitimized on, on this uh, public and political level, uh, and also pointed that the, the leader, Zaldo Stanov, uh, is on the list on uh, international sanction, there are supporters refer to them as the direct descendants of Soviet liberators. Um, so uh, it was quite successful, although marginal, but uh, also quite su successful. So over the next few years, every May, the Czech countryside, countryside was traversed by a multinational motorcycle convoy comprising the Russian night wolves and their European allies, and more and more commemorative sites, sites around the country were added to the program. So the, the introduction to the Night Wolves was quite successful. And lately, uh, lately the, the, this international cooperation was reinforced by, uh, th uh, through, uh, through invitation to Russia, where, where Czech motorcycle clubs uh, um, participated in various uh, activities in uh, this Daroga uh, in, 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 in Russian, they were invited to the, uh, to the anniversary of Night Wolves in, uh, in Moscow, and also they, they uh, made trip to, to occupied territories. Uh, th this, this is from, from the bike show, this bombastic bike show that uh, Night Wolves in, in Sevastopol in uh, Crimea, are irregularly performing and also Czech uh, motorcycle members who were invited to these events. But they were also invited to make a trip to, through, through Donbass. And also, of course, these trips were, were associated with uh, anti-Ukrainian propaganda uh, by in, in this, their social networks, like putting photographs and commentary about alleged fa fascism in, uh, in Ukraine. Uh, and in the two, two, uh, 2020, when the pandemic of coronavirus uh, uh, didn't make possible to, to, for, for um, Russian night wolf to come to Europe, so, so they the, the Czech uh, section substituted them. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> and in two, 2021, uh, they went in opposite direction to, to the Russia and Russian television uh, re uh, 
reference to it as, a, as the, the road, uh, road home. So they really took the, the agenda of Russian knife, knife, night wolves. Um, we have another example of uh, transformation or transmitting of, of the tradition. This is uh, the immortal regiment walk, which is another social movement that had been appro appropriated by, by the the Russian state and then f uh, further exported to, to other, other countries, to Czechos uh, Czech Republic as well. What is interesting that uh, on the first picture, when it was organized in 2016 for the first time in Prague, all, uh, together with the compatriot uh, organizations and Czech pro-Russian activists in the f front line, we can see the same person who was previously or organizing the, the, the demonstration against Ukraine. Um, this movement spread uh, and next year in the 2070s there were diff various ma marches in uh, various uh, town, towns. And there was also an uh, official agreement uh, about, um, among one of the uh, compatriot uh, organization uh, in Prague and, and the representative of uh, uh, Rush, uh, immortal regiment of Russia. So it has this organizational roof. Um, what is interesting is the, the way how, um, how this uh, tradition is transported in the, in the Czech Republic where there are not so many uh, relatives who you can take with you to, to the parade. So people uh, sort of some kind of bricolage. You, you, you can see Stalin, for example. Uh, you can see uh, some general, uh, uh, general figures of uh, resistance, like uh, Julius Fucic, for example which certainly is not a, a relative of the person who, take, uh, who is taking him with him. And also, all, all these uh, activities were all the time uh, associated with anti-Ukrainian uh, propaganda with, uh, and wrapped in this um, call for uh, uh, fight against falsifications or falsification of, of, of the history. Um, also, which is interesting, this immortal regiment has a, a, also an a international structure. Um, so the, the, the celebrating of the merits of the Rush Red Army can be all coordinated on the international level. This is from one of these, uh, of these activities when also the pandemic didn't allow to, to to do very massive uh, activities. They are composing, um, the various countries are composing, in fact, some sort of uh, sentence with this spominaim, something like that. So I have to, to go oh, sorry, to the conclusion. Oh, I don't have any conclusion because it's not concluded. <laughs> And uh, it is, uh, of course, the question how the situation uh, will, uh, will be after, after the open war to, to the Ukraine. Of course, um, the, the friendship with Russia uh, manifested through worshipping the myth of the great patriotic war is tested now. And it was, uh, it was evident in the most recent celebration of the end of the Second World War. Uh, in the May, for example, there were no uh, bombastic trips uh, of uh, night wolves. Also, there were some, but very limited. There were no uh, marches of immortal regiments. And all these activities uh, were kind of uh, very, very limited or very, very special. So, and, and we can see some kind of restructuring of, of the comp Russian compatriot world and its local allies. And of course, there are new uh, ur urgent issues like, uh, like energy crisis or steep inflation, which seems to be much, uh, much more successful and relevant for mobilization of masses. Um, 
rather than some kind of abstract fight uh, against uh, falsification history. And if we compare uh, demonstrations now, which we have anti-government, and, and so they took th uh, thousands of people uh, compared to the demonstration we had several years ago against Ukraine, which was several, like maybe tens or maybe hundreds of people. So this is in, in rather... Um, Incomparable. So the, the pro-Soviet, uh, pro-Russian, sorry, pro-Russian activists have another another issues to to, to use, but never but nevertheless there there are some signs that this um, this legacy of great patriotic war uh, remains some kind of in in, in their agenda. So I, I will finish by that. Uh, thank you for attention. Thank you very much, Maria, for your presentation and as well for bringing us the photos because I think for most of us uh, these were quite different images of Prague that we all have seen before when we come here as tourists. So, uh, so thank you for that as well. There was castle as well. Yeah, there was the castle as well, but in the background behind people we, we, we maybe have never seen before. Um, so directly from the German-Polish border um, is Frank Grelka now here. From uh, He's a research fellow at the Center for Interdisciplinary Polish Studies at the European University Viadrina in Frankfurt-Oder. He, he deals with, and um, he's not only dealing with, but he publishes intensively about various aspects of Polish, Ukrainian and Soviet history among others about German occupation in Poland uh, and the Ukraine and the history of Stalinism and National Socialism. Uh, one of his publications is the Ukrainian is about the Ukrainian national movement under German occupation 1918 and 1941-42 and here you see already that one of his focuses is on the early 20th century as well so it's no wonder that today he is going to talk about the German Russian revisionist uh, consensus over Ukraine 1918 till uh, 2022 Frank Reichert. Thank you so much uh, Markus for this kind introduction Thanks to the organizers for this generous invitation to a really inspiring conference. Um, I have been working on uh, Polish-German-Russian relations over the, well, a couple of years in the past, and I was thinking in context of this conflict, it would be not, not a bad idea to look at Ukraine between Russia and Germany. And I thought revisionism would be a good concept to look at um, this triangle of relationship. Actually, uh, yesterday we had, had this, this complicated street name, Kshemenshova, yeah? Kshemenshova, I don't know what, what is harder to spell for me, Kshemenshova or revisionism. <laughs> Maybe when you hear, and you cannot understand me, it's always revision, revisionism, yes? Okay, for this presentation. <laughs> okay, so uh, as a historian, I work with the past. However, today I would like to share my thoughts on the present. Usually historians contextualize current ev events uh, from the past to make more or less educated guesses about present developments. Here I discuss the popularity of revisionist sentiment for German and Russian policy with regard to Ukraine. For revisionism like socialism, communism and nationalism, the end point was always known or assumed. Territorial aspirations fully satisfied was a point generally situated in the future and oftentimes in the past, but never in the present. Still, I think the memory of revisionist policies in Ukraine might teach us a lesson for the present. This talk discusses the changing status of Ukraine between two major powers struggling for mutual recognition since the First World War. My arguments are based on earlier research by Holly Case and Michelle Murray on territorial revisionism and the social aspects of revisionist history in international relations. In the past, and this is a general idea of my presentation, and, and until February 24, Germany and Russia were bound to notions of original solidarity when it comes to Ukraine. I argue that references to a widely discussed World War II German guilt play less a role than German policy of misrecognition of Ukraine since 1918. 
In my presentation, I will first briefly discuss aspects of German and Russian power diplomacy over Ukraine in the context of the world wars. Particularly, I look at continuities, discontinuities of revisionist policies until 2022. For reasons of time, I will focus on the periods until 1945 and from 1991, when Ukraine became an independent state. In discussing the significance uh, of revisionism as a concept to explain the current situation historically, I was not concerned with ideas and debates around the possible borders of uh, the Ukrainian nation or ethnicity. Rather with the question why the revisionist pol policy of Moscow and Berlin de determined Ukraine as a minor power over the history of the last 100 years. On this slide you find territorial, ideolo ideological and political aspects of what I call the revisionist consensus between Russia and Germany over the Ukrainian status. On the one hand, Ukraine's status is determined by immaterial factors, for example by the R Russian self-image to be the major power in this region, and Germany's historical role as a gatekeeper deciding over Ukraine's future between East and West. When it comes to material factors, on the other hand, the borders of Ukraine have defined Russia as a major power since the times of the Romanov Empire. From the German perspective, Kiev was always the key to end Moscow's domination over the whole region. The famous face by Paul Rohrbach, he who has Kiev can defeat Russia, has never been implemented in German foreign policy ever since. In his 1915 article, the advisor to the German Imperial Foreign Office was thinking about containing Russia's expansionist aspirations by safeguarding an independent Ukrainian state. On the contrary, the German Ukraine politic interests targeted at Ukrainian resources. In fact, decision makers in Berlin rather would not challenge the dominance of the Russian culture in Ukraine to date. In a longer perspective, Russia and Germany were bound to a mutual solidarity as to containing Ukraine's aspirations for a nation-state of its own. During and in the aftermath of the First World War, Ukraine was the main battlefield in the war between Russia and Germany. German and Austrian troops returned to Kiev in January 1918 in an attempt to change the fortunes of war which has already been lost on the Western Front. This photo depicts the German military in the Ukrainian capital. Right after the abolition of the first independent Ukrainian National Republic in April 1918, the German-Austrian occupation restored a monarchist puppet government under the Russian General Pavlos Skoropatsky. For the Bolshevik Revolution at the same time, Ukraine was the key for the consolidation of their domestic power status. In the years to come, Soviet Ukraine was one of the central stages for Soviet aff affirmative action. Just little more than 10 years after the Red October, forced collectivization led to what some historians call the Ukrainian Holodomor. One can say that mutual recognition as major powers and the negation of Ukrainian statehood were the pillars of the Soviet-German revisionist consensus pre precisely since 100 years. That is, since the Treaty of Rapale in 1922. Again, in the 1930s, Germany and the Soviet Union became the major revisionist powers on the continent. The constant multi-sided competition and surveillance altered the dynamic of domestic and foreign revisionist, revisionist, revisionist strategies sorry, and affected the way policies were formed and carried out on the ground. In September 1939, the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact was formally a non-aggression pact between Nazi Germany and, Soviet, and the Soviet Union that enabled those powers to petition Poland between them. The Wehrmacht took Western and Central Poland, while Eastern Poland became part of the Soviet Ukraine. Under the leadership of Nazi Germany, all tripartite pact member states were pursuing a politics of revisionism since August 1914. Although Axis members had different visions of the new European order, Berlin assured those who committed the most to the efforts against the Soviet Union would be rewarded with territorial adjustments after the war. On this slide you find a Nazi propaganda poster from 1941 which can deal as an example for Germans' failed promise for a better future for Ukraine in both world wars. 
Far from retaining or regaining any territories, Ukraine was temporarily under German occupation and a major site of the German genocide of the European Jews. After occupying major parts of Eastern Europe, revisionism turned out to be a self-fulfilling prophecy for Moscow. But for Germany, the same policy resulted in a self-defeating prophecy. May 9, 1945 determined the USSR as a superpower. While well, Germany ceases to be a major power and was replaced by the United States as a status quo power until the end of the Cold War. After the fall of the Soviet Empire in 1991, Russia remained a status quo power in Eastern Europe and Ukraine became a member state of the Commonwealth of Independent States in the same year. As a major power within the European Union, Germany has continuously sought recognition as the new and old gatekeeper over the region. As Ukraine maintained in the Russian sphere of interest, Germany continued its status quo policy. Here acknowledging Ukrainian independence, they are eager to recognize Moscow as a decision maker safeguarding security in the region. The Orange Revolution from 2004 opted clearly for an anti-revisionist agenda. That is for the separation of the authoritarian policy the still governing Russian president has implemented since the year 2000. While the revolution can be called the symbolic end of the post-Soviet era in Ukraine, Russia tried to turn the clocks back. Against this, Polish and Lithuanian leaders joined the Ukrainian anti-revisionist solidarity, while again Germany decided to pursue its separate policy towards, Mo towards Moscow known as Shane's through trade, handel durch wandel. This slogan then continued to be the German doctrine of for Eastern affairs ever since 1952. Also after 1991, the most influential lobbies of the German economy, first of all the Ostausschuss, persisted to provide support to companies investing in Russia and in other post-Soviet countries, but significantly not in Poland, the Baltic states or East Central Europe. Domestic affairs within Ukraine did not change much after, after the Euromaidan from 2014 when, Ukrainian, when the Ukrainian people fought for their perspective to become a member state of the Euro European Union. Internationally, Germany did not want to renounce Russia as a, as a status quo power in the region for the well-known economic reasons. Again, Berlin sacrificed Ukrainians' European aspirations on the altar of its strategic partnership with Russia. Despite Germany's unilateral action, Berlin's NATO partners in Eastern Europe had to trust that Germany was able to contain the Russian Federation and its revisionist appetite continuously. The Russian policy since 2014, including the ongoing war in Ukraine, can due to Michael, sorry, to Michelle Murray and her 2090 book, The Struggle for Recognition in International Relations, be described as, quote, revisionism as a social phenomenon, end of quote. Revisionism in this framework finds its roots in the social interactions a power has with other states as it seeks to maintain its identity as a major power. Major powers as Russia possess, possess first-rate military capabilities, spheres of interest, but perhaps more, more importantly are also under, understood to have certain special rights and duties to maintain the international order. In the same context, Russia's power recognition claims are traditionally dire directed toward established powers. For example, when the US President Barack Obama called Russia a regional power in 2014, Russia must have felt misrecognized its status as a major power. With the February attack, Russia wants to revise its international position as a status quo power. In this case, the Kremlin instigates an international crisis that captures the intention of established powers and demands a response, a response from them. Most interestingly, from a historical perspective, Russia's strategy forces Germany to give finally in to its strategic partnership with Moscow or to lose its position as a major power in the European Union. For Berlin, this would mean to give up its revisionist solidarity with Moscow over Ukraine. This is what I would call a Zeitenwende, even if the German government might not agree with me exactly on this point. From a historical perspective, however, and I would like to conclude, this turning point, point is rather a new era of territorial, territorial revisionism in Europe. 
Well, this will always last slide, yes. <laughs> so just as Germany pursued the revision of the Versailles peace order in the 1930s, the Russian Federation today is no longer willing to accept the defeat of the Soviet Union in the Cold War. Territorial revisionism is a template under which the goals of the Russian and German wars of conquest in Eastern Europe emerge. From a Ukrainian perspective, similarities between the so-called Minsk Agreement and the Munich Agreement over Czechoslovakia in 1938 cannot be ignored. In both cases, attempts failed to appease the revisionist power by recognizing its expansionist policies since 2014 in Crimea and eastern Ukraine. Another similarity is that Russia, like Nazi Germany at the time, pretends to be waging a preventive war for the good of humanity itself. The Nazis spoke of wanting to liberate Europe from the Bolshevik danger. Russia wants to denazify Ukraine. Berlin and Moscow justified their territorial claims in the Sudetenland and the Donbas with the supposed persecution of ethnic Russian and German populations in other states. One predictable outcome of this war, in my opinion, seems to be most obvious. Germany foreign, Germany's foreign policy will bid farewell to its revisionist legacy in Ukraine and finally submit to the anti-revisionist doctrine of European foreign policy. Thank you very much. Vielen Dank, Frank Gräker. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, Frank Greker showed us as contemporary historians, as I am one uh, at least, that view back far or deep into history before 1945, before 1938 or even 1933 can be a very good idea. Thank you. Thank you for that. We go on on our panel um, uh, and we welcome Peter Rugenthaler from from Austria now no I'm sorry before before I, I present you I forgot to to say to everybody here we will hear now all the presentations if you have questions or remarks uh, if you have comments please write them down or remember them because we will discuss all four presentations afterwards. But now we come to Peter Rugenthaler from Austria. We are really happy that you are here because I think it was not easy coming here as the, all the trains stopped in Austria yesterday because the train workers of the Austrian railway uh, company are on strike. But, uh, but good that you made it here. So um, Peter Rugenthaler is a historian. He deals with Cold War, Soviet Union, forced labor and national socialism. And he is the deputy director of the Ludwig Boltzmann Institute for Research of War Consequences in Graz in Austria. Um, a moving spirit, we can say so, an organizer of many Cold War history related international projects uh, and the author of his newest book, Austria during the Cold War, which uh, is now on the market in German, but uh, is translated at the moment into English language as well, Austria during the Cold War. Um, Peter Rugenthaler's presentation has the title Reflections on the Russian Aggression in Ukraine from an Austrian perspective. Thank you very much. Actually, I do not have a presentation, a PowerPoint pre presentation, but thank you anyway. Um, I, I, let me very briefly explain you the specific situation in Austria, since I was asked to, to do that. Um, actually, I would say that the memory of the past did not play any role in the decision making how to stand on Ukraine or how to stand on the war. Maybe it is, it's just a thesis, because Austria also, together with Russia in the work on reconciliation, within the past 30 years, has overcome the history. Um, actually, the Austrian government was seen in the last years as very pro-Russian. You may remember how Putin came to Austria, uh, danced together with the foreign minister and so on. Um, um, yeah, but the situation on 24th February was very clear. Uh, already on that day, the Austrian foreign minister uh, took a very clear stance and spoke in the evening news uh, on the end of an era, um, Epochenbruch, um, that uh, nothing will remain as it was. So uh, when I saw the pictures of your presentation, the first one, all these uh, celebrations on the 9th of May, all this uh, reconciliation work as we saw it in Austria was done within the last 30 years, thanks to the fact um, that both sides, yeah, 
for the last 30 years, the Russian and the Austrian, was ready to do that. The Russians opened the archives for us, we opened our archives for them. I'm not talking about research now, um, about political, diplomatic history, Cold War history, uh, since you mentioned uh, Cold War conferences and so on, but uh, the humanitarian side. Um, we, for example, published some already 15 years ago, a memory book of 90,000 um, that bur buried in Austrian soil uh, Soviet citizens, um, forced laborers, uh, concentration camps, inmates, Red Army soldiers, and so on. But all this stopped now. Yeah, we do not have any yeah celebrations on 9th of May or. Uh, even the Russian side, I think, did not, uh, I mean, this, um, when you saw the pictures on Brno, yeah, it reminds me on a very yeah, offensive uh, embassy work in Czech Republic uh, from the Russian side. Nothing uh, in this sphere or has happened in Austria in this year. Um, once uh, uh, Austria was always accused in being uh, economically dependent on Russia, um, I would now say after six or seven months uh, of the war, actually it's lasting already more than nine months, if Austria was dependent or got 80% of uh, its gas uh, at the beginning of this year from Russia, it's now less than 20. I would even really uh, say um, it was simply driven by economic interests, of course, uh, but not by political reasons. Uh, if you just remember the words of Alexander van der Bellen, Austria's uh, president, who takes a very clear stance uh, towards Ukraine, but to just remember his words just four years ago when Putin came to to Austria to prolong this um, long-term um, gas uh, contract when he just simply declared yeah, to the audience, to the international journalists, it is very simple, uh, something like this. He said, it is just cheaper. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, so if really anyone in the Kremlin believed that uh, within this, of, of course, I'm not talking about that they do not use gas as a uh, weapon, actually they do, yeah. But um, the situation also clearly shows that uh, already within a few months this uh, almost is coming to an end and uh, in the next year I think the situation will completely change. Just let me say some words on the memory of the past. As you know, Austria, uh, more than one third of Austria's territory has been under Soviet occupation from 1945 to 1955 for 10 years after Austria has been liberated by all the Allied armies, including the Red Army, with all the atrocities, raping and murderers. Um, of course, in 1955, it was the most um, important agenda was to get yeah, the Russians out of the country, uh, to conclude uh, the state treaty, to get an agreement with Moscow. And uh, the only discussion which um, came up, of course, and since you were discussing yesterday the issue of Finland, as I've heard, let me just uh, briefly explain or tell you some uh, points on Austrian neutrality or what, Austria, what neutrality for Austria means. Um, now, internationally, it's almost seen also uh, or treated as, okay, they want to remain neutral, so they are more or less pro-Russian. This is not the case. Uh, actually, neutrality is a question of identity uh, for Austria. Um, it is uh, mainly based on, uh, not on knowledge, and, yeah, it, um, um, let me go back a little bit uh, to the roots. Uh, the Aust Austria's Chancellor Karl Nehammer at the beginning of the war said that, um, and he was very much criticized for that, but he is not that false, that, as I said in German, uh, the neutralität wurde uns aufgezwungen von der Sowjetunion. So it was, the Soviet Union forced us to um, become neutral, which is not that false, because uh, one could even could, could argue if in 1955 the Austrian government would have really have had a free choice, uh, they probably would have uh, um, joined NATO already then. Yeah, 
uh, communists uh, played a marginal or even not a role, uh, you know, the, uh, already in, at the elections in 1945, they took only 5%, which was mostly a consequence of the behavior of the Red Army in Austria. So, um, uh, the neutrality in 1955 was the price the Austrian government was then ready to pay to get an agreement, a bilateral agreement with Moscow, which was not a, um, a legal agreement, but just more or less uh, when the Austrian delegation was invited in April 1955 for, for final talks to the Soviet Union to reach a not formal agreement, uh, so to say, um, the promise um, of the Soviet Union to sign the state treaty, to conclude the state treaty, if the Austrian government would oblique itself after the withdrawal of the Allied troops in October 1955 to permanent neutrality. So it is of course written in the constitution, it is a constitutional law uh, which obliques Austria to yeah, pursue the, the, the neutrality. Um, so Austrians have learned what neutrality means in 1956, they did so in 1968, and so on. But what neutrality is, it is clearly a question of definition uh, itself by the Austrian government, which, uh, yeah, I'm not talking about the um, evolution of neutrality now, but um, so if the today's Austria, Austria's chancellor still says, Austria is neutral, so is on the one hand, uh, uh, of course, right, on the other, of course, not. So, um, I mean, uh, within the last 30 years, much has been changed, and even the constitutional law has been changed a, a, a few times, just in order, really, to, to uh, join the European Union. Otherwise, it would not have been possible even to join the European Union in 1995. So. Um, um, compared especially to the neighboring countries, I mean, Hungary is a very special case, but uh, um, just remembering again the pictures I saw on the Czech Republic, I think there is a consensus on the one side that uh, um, um, how to stand with Ukraine, um, how to deal with Putin. If Karl Nehammer went to Putin in the first days after the beginning of the wars, this was in my eyes, um, first of all, a signal um, to the Austrian population, more or less, okay, we at least try it to show it makes no sense on the one hand side. The other argument which was uh, put forward uh, was that he simply wanted to see Putin, how, in which condition, you may remember all the rumors that he just become crazy and so on, he just wanted to see him personally. Um, 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 but actually, um, if, if one word on the, on the political right in Austria, since the political uh, arena is very complicated as well, and uh, if they are on the rise at the moment, again, uh, we do have now a government coalition, um, um, the Green Party and the Conservative Party, but now again the um, Freedoms Party is about 25% on the first place again which is, uh, cannot be explained because of Austria's stance um, uh, towards Ukraine, but mainly, again, migration issues are on the top, of course. You see all the pictures, um, um, uh, the Hungarian-Austrian border, um, especially, mostly the feeling no one is doing anything against that. And uh, so this is the, the, the classical topic of the Freedoms Party is coming back. Um, they took, of course, another stance towards the sanctions, not against the war, but their really meaning is, let us just, uh, the sanctions will not end the war, so that we can stop the sanctions and we will live all together as we lived before. So just uh, absolutely, mostly playing with the feeling of the people and giving them to understand once the sanctions end, I guess, and everything will be cheaper again. So that's just, uh, in my eyes, uh, playing with uh, the feelings, as they did also um, within the pandemic. Yeah. Um, um, and one more issue I want to raise, and then please just don't hesitate uh, to, to ask me questions, since I'm coming from Graz, uh, which is ruled since one year by a 
communist mayor. Absolutely not understandable for anyone. A uh, very specific situation since the Communist Party never played any role, especially in the Cold War and even not after that. Graz is uh, simply, um, um, and today they are de debating the financial situation uh, of the city um, since uh, money is not going out, how to say in English, um, we stehen vor einem Bankrott. So one year after ruling, common, the, the, the communists are playing, of course, the previous governments. But uh, it's all, I'm joking about it because it's, it's uh, senseless um, to speak seriously about that. Yeah, of course, not, nor ideology played any role. Um, nor did so, um, the, the, yeah, one can say that even not the party program, of course, but what uh, actually the um, chairman of the Communist Party is doing is a woman, she's, uh, yeah, helping people. It's like uh, they are even called like um, uh, Caritas, yeah, um, uh, really going to the roots, helping the poorest of the poor. And it was uh, simply due to the fact that on the days of the elections, almost uh, every second. Uh, remained at home and did not vote. It was clear that uh, uh, the conservative mayor will stay, but it happened uh, and that it, it was uh, suddenly a clear victory for her. So, but it was, how to say, not even the Freedom Party who supported all these um, separatists in Donetsk or Lukashenko, but it was her people of the Communist Party of Styria. Uh, one went to Belarus last year, we are celebrating with uh, giving interviews there, the other one went to the People's Republic of Donetsk, uh, celebrating anniversaries there. Um, yeah, it was a scandal in the media, so it was raised up regularly, but um, yeah, it's for one or two days uh, there are some reactions, then it calms down and no one is speaking about that. So um, this is the really very, yeah, more or less strange situation, or, but, but not that easy to explain as it is mostly when I read international news or how they see it. Is, uh, so one can explain everything, of course, um, uh, but um, I don't see any danger within this regard for, for the future. Yeah. So, thank you. Thank you very much for this, uh, for this let's say, surprising uh, um, uh, remarks on, on inner Austrian politics and, uh, and the general um, attention Austrians paid to the war there, which was new for me, so it was interesting. Please, if you have questions, if you have remarks, uh, keep them, because we have a last presentation now, and afterwards uh, there will be time enough for discussions and for questions and remarks. So um, today from Germany, but originally from Russia, Alexei Kaminsky came uh, to our conference today. He's a researcher and author of various publications on public history and critical thinking, for example, uh, on the so-called Polish operation of the NK NKVD in the Perm region in Russia, 1937-38. He was a board member of uh, Memorial uh, in Perm, uh, the, uh, the human rights organization and historical organization, and he was associated professor of the Higher School of Economics in Perm, Perm, Perm whoever that, how, however that is in English, uh, in Russia. I say he was because, um, because as you know, uh, the Memorial organi organization was forbidden uh, in Russia with the beginning of the war against the Ukraine. So most of the members of Memorial had to leave Russia. Alexei Kamensky is one of them. He's today in Mainz uh, in Germany uh, working uh, at the University of Mainz. But um, what we really have to say, an important information is, you all might know, but I think it's not too late to congratulate you once again because Memorial won together with the Center for Civil Liberties in the Ukraine and Alice Bialyatsky, 
in, uh, in Belarus uh, this year's Nobel Peace Prize. So congratulations for that. Thank you that you came here today, Alexei. And now we hear your presentation, The Language of the Great Patriotic War. We heard about that from the Czech um, perspective already today. The Language of the Great Patriotic War as a Substitution, 2014 till 2022. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen. Uh, <clears throat> I'm happy uh, for the possibility to uh, share with you uh, with some of my refle uh, observations and reflections on the one of the main uh, themes, uh, one of the main topics of the language of Putin propaganda uh, in the conflict against, uh, the, against Ukraine. Uh, I have to begin my presentation with a kind of disclaimer. The object of my discussion is the Russian public discourse of so-called Great Patriotic War used for description, conceptualizing and legitimizing of the events which began, uh, began early spring of uh, 2014 with annexation of Crimea, uh, initiation of military conflict in eastern Ukraine by Russia, uh, and continued until February 24th of this year. Since the beginning of um, full-scale invasion, the character of public discourse in Russia sub uh, substantially changed, uh, this date is a final limit for the object of my presentation. In this sense, my current report is a kind of retrospection. But I hope this retrospection uh, can, uh, can help to understand better the tragic events of the last months. Well, since the very beginning uh, of uh, 14, a group of philologists, uh, social psychologists, uh, political analytics, including uh, Gassan Gusein of uh, Alexander Morozov, uh, Maxim Krangaus, and many others, uh, and headed by Marina Vishnevetska, your photo you see, uh, her photo, sorry, uh, sorry you see. Uh, uh, initiated a project, uh, Dictionary of Changes, uh, in which uh, week by week, month by one, uh, month, the changes in public uh, language uh, in Russia were traced. It is a very important project uh, uh, for, I think, uh, researchers of the public uh, dis uh, forums of discourse <coughs> in uh, Russia. Uh, and uh, the materials of the dictionary prove what any person uh, who was a witness of the events of uh, 2014 could remember. The massive use in propaganda language, the terms, images, and rhetorical schemes referring to uh, the narrative of the Great Patriotic War for the description and conceptualizing of the current events. This is uh, uh, an illustration of some main tool uh, which, used, which was used uh, by the uh, participants of the projects. Uh, and some illustrations, maybe. Uh, a few, surely, from many, many, many. Uh, the language of a great uh, patriotic war, uh, well, this is not uh, the very pleasant. I, uh, I think uh, all of us remember such examples. Uh, for example, this person, Igor Strelkov, a Girkin, uh, and, and explain how the forms of historical imagination uh, easily uh, transmitted into actual politics. Uh, So-called uh, military reconstruction uh, games uh, became uh, the uh, forms of uh, real military aggression. Oh, all these illustrations, I think uh, they are also not needing a detailed explanation. So, uh, how could it become possible? How could the language of the Great Patriotic War uh, could become the language for description of the current events of 2014? 
I think uh, to form the answer uh, on this question, we ought to remember about two central themes dominated in the uh, imaginative canon if to use a term of Aleida Asman with her uh, distinguishing of uh, uh, canon and archive of historical memory. Uh, so in canon of Russian public historical imagination, uh, on the eve of aggression. These are the first, the concept of three fraternal peoples, Russians, Ukrainians, and Belarus, uh, Belarusians. Uh, really a slightly modified uh, in Soviet period, version of the uh, concept of uh, imperial times, concept of so-called triune uh, Russian people, great Russians, Malo Russians, and uh, white Russians, Belarusians, which from the time of uh, Fyafan Prokopovich uh, became uh, one of the central construct of imperial ideology in uh, Russian Empire. Uh, Nikita Sokolov, a uh, brilliant Russian historian, uh, demonstrates in his research uh, that since uh, Nikolai Kramzin's uh, memoir on ancient and modern Russia to our days, this concept uh, translated through school history uh, textbooks, uh, forming historical vision, uh, historical optics uh, of Russians. The second theme, the second uh, the complex of tropes, uh, is the narrative of the great uh, war and the great victory uh, as a, a, a main, uh, main event of the uh, contemporary history, of the modern history. Uh, it's very important to uh, have in our uh, uh, analysis that uh, for three last decades, this concept, uh, these narratives of the Great Patriotic War, uh, acquires uh, quite uh, principally new characteristics, which uh, distinguish it from uh, the similar uh, narratives of the Great Patriotic War of the Soviet period. I think uh, a short video may be useful for us to, uh, to uh, analyze this Distinguishing, sorry, a moment. Uh, right. This video is not so beautiful as uh, uh, uh yesterday, uh, but it is very, very important for us. Only a minute with a half, not half. Осенью 41-го у стен столицы решалась судьба страны. Красная армия несла потери в боях с превосходящими силами противника. Несмотря на тяжелую обстановку на подступах к Москве, было принято решение о проведении военного парада на Красной площади 7 ноября. Это был парад мужества и непреклонной решимости отстоять столицу. Это был парад защитников Москвы от стен Кремля. Они уходили на передовую, чтобы стоять на смерть на московских рубежах. That's enough, I think. Uh, uh -huh. Well, thank yeah. you. Thank you. So, what are the messages? of this short uh, public presentation, of uh, this form of commemoration. 
The first, the Great Patriotic War is a meta-historical, eternally lasting event. Its heroes are always among us. They are ready to battle with their eternal enemy. Who is this enemy? Surely the, clear is, uh, the answer is clear. Is, is clear. Uh, this is a fascist, some arch enemy uh, whom the generations of Soviet and post-Soviet uh, people uh, learned to hate. But who is a fascist now? in 2011. Anybody, anybody who will be marked as a fascist. Surely, uh, this language of Soviet propaganda, uh, uh, in, in the language of Soviet propaganda, there was a persistent te the tendency to use in the context of the Cold War the rhetorical figure of a fascist as a universal blank for an enemy while appealing to the uh, actual experience of the collective trauma of the Second World War. However, it was the actual experience of the generation that have gone through the war that defined the limits of such language. Although, but uh, 2011, there were hardly any members of this generation left. So, freedom for historical imagination. But what event is the object of commemoration in 7th of November Parrot? For, an, uh, for, for any uh, Soviet people, the answer is clear, surely. This is uh, the uh, anniversary of a uh, great October Socialist Revolution, the main event of the human history. Just to the memory of this event, a parrot having place on the Red Square, uh, 7th November of uh, 41, 41st, uh, was devoted. Uh, this event was included uh, by the historian imagination of its participants uh, in the main Soviet historical narrative. But what is the historical denotate for the parrot of 7th November of 2011th? The answer is paradoxical, I think. This is a parrot. <laughs> the sign of parrot is a parrot. Such a way. We observe here a replacement of the constitutive, uh, constitutive political myth, which consolidates the nation as an imagined community, using the term of Benedict Anderson, uh, surely. If, for Soviet political ideology, such, such constitutive myth was a myth about the Great October Revolution, uh, which established uh, the principally new form of the human society, and the victory in the World War II was used as a convincing demonstration of the progressive character of Marx, Engels, Lenin uh, teaching, then in modern Russia, the Great Patriotic War and the Great Victory th th themselves become such constitutive events remembrance of which pretends to establish the current Russian nation as an imagined political unity. Oh. This is a very important uh, difference between the Soviet and... Ah, oh. <coughs> this is terrible. <laughs> well, <laughs> sorry. Uh, this is very important... Um, uh, difference between a Soviet and uh, modern Russian uh, narratives of the Great Patriotic War. Uh, and uh, for uh, understanding uh, of the political ideology of uh, modern Russia itself. Uh, not uh, uh, the real events uh, which uh, resulted in uh, emergence of contemporary Russia and its uh, current uh, boundaries. Uh, for example, uh, the victory upon uh, Gekachipe in August uh, of uh, 91st, uh, either the agreement and Belovesh in Belovesh push and uh, the abolition of the, of the Soviet Union, uh, but the events that predates the very formation of the modern Russian state by 46 years became in historical imagination the events uh, that had established the current, current political community. The election of the victory 
as a constitutive uh, event of the modern political community, uh, defines the uh, inseparable ideological identity with the imagined Soviet people. In uh, 2020s, uh, it was uh, formulated in uh, a new version of Russian constitu uh, constitution. <laughs> oh, and also, uh, it defends the contemporary political revanchism and expansionism, which, after uh, 14, 2014, defines Russian foreign, uh, foreign poli uh, policy towards the states uh, which acquired political independence after the collapse of the uh, Soviet Union. In 2014, the narrative of the Great Patriotic War uh, became a substitutive historical analogy. Uh, how does it work? Uh, we have already seen the, the symbolic figure of the fascist as the eternal enemy in the meta-historical Great Patriotic War existed in the 11 as an empty form. In the spring of 14, uh, this form was filled by a simple sophistic substitution. Its content becomes the image of a Ukrainian who resists to be turned into a part of the three young Russian people. That is, in the logic of propaganda, a fascist in a nationally specified form of the murderous man. Uh, note in uh, parentheses that uh, this actualizes a rhetorical scheme well known to the Soviet propaganda. A Ukrainian who does not want to be a loyal Soviet man is a Banderas man. That is, according to this logic, a, fa a, a fascist. A caricature from uh, sat uh, satiric journal Peretz. As along with, uh, with it, uh, Putin's propaganda actively uses the trope of three, three fraternal peoples, or uh, by... Uh, 21 uh, imperial version of uh, triune Russian people, uh, it logically arrives at the rhetorical figure imperative of liberation the fraternal Ukrainian people from the fascist Banderovs. Uh, we ought to add to this a resurrection of rhetorical formulas from the Cold War era when the figure of fascist uh, as the main uh, enemy was filled with America. One of many examples. Uh, this propaganda formula, we are fighting in Ukraine with America or collective West, just as it was during the Second World War. Sorry, for, for, for me as a historical, uh, as a historian is a, uh, is a strange, very strange. But in the logic of this language is an absolutely uh, reasonable uh, conclusion. Uh, some uh, quotations. Uh, in Putin's meeting with uh, so-called uh, historian uh, activists uh, at uh, 22nd June uh, of uh, 2016, uh, a short quotation. Every soldier we raise stands in line with those who raise him because they were such great men that Europe is still at war with them, with them dead, still at war. Oh, sorry. Uh, well, <laughs> so the image of Ukrainian uh, in this language of uh, 14 and, uh, and further uh, is split. Uh, Ukrainian is Either uh, the Ukrainians either do not exist at, at all, because Ukrainians are Malarusians, a variety of Russians, uh, and the rhetorics uh, we are one nation is used, or being rhetorically replaced by the figure of a fascist, uh, they acquire all the characteristics of this archetypal, uh, archetypical enemy, uh, which is, uh, in this case, uh, a demonized uh, collective quest. Uh, some, sub uh, some themes uh, that works in this uh, substitutive discourse are the themes of uh, heroical death, which alone uh, can acquire with a sense uh, any human life. Alexei, uh, excuse yeah. me to interrupt you because we are really running out of time. 
it's uh, it's already the part of child uh, child death. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, 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 state. Uh, Annexation, sorry, the uh, discourse of immortal, immortal uh, regiment. Uh, the form of universal legitimation in uh, contemporary Russian Stalinist discourse. And, uh, well, uh, a, a, a way to legitimate even uh, the discourse of Gulag. Because uh, in uh, Gulag camps, uh, the prisoners worked for the victory together with all Soviet uh, people. So, uh, th that's all. Thank <laughs> <laughs> you. Thank you very much, Alexei, for, for bringing us back to, uh, uh, to the propaganda and the, the, the images of the great patriotic war. So we take, uh, we have a couple of minutes left for if you have uh, questions and comments. Um, we have heard about um, uh, from the Czech Republic of a mixture of the great patriotic war propaganda and anti-Ukrainian manifestations. We have learned uh, about a long tradition of disregard of the Ukraine as a state. In, in Germany, we had a look inside a neutral country, which is not that neutral, maybe, concerning uh, the war against the Ukraine. And we have watched uh, the reenactment of, uh, of the Soviet victory parades on the Red Square in Moscow up to today. So we have a great variety of uh, subjects and ideas and presentations. If you have questions, remarks, or comments, please give us a sign. <laughs> Uh, Herr Borowik, we have a microphone, I think. Um, ah. <laughs> Thank you very much for the fascinating talks. Uh, I have two questions and one, one comment, one, one remark. Uh, the first question is to uh, Mrs. Czerna. Um, in my communication with uh, uh, right radicals in Germany and with, uh, with left radicals, I, I, I could observe such narrative, and it is very important that this narrative has a, another side. Uh, so it's directed against Americans, not, not against Germans. And uh, it was very funny uh, to hear from the right radicals that, that, that Soviets liberated us from Nazism and so on and so far. But uh, my question is, uh, is it something like um, a symbolical substitution for uh, anti-globalism, anti-Americanism, or real uh, fascinating in this, this, this discourse and this, this symbolic of, of great victory and so on and so far. I, I, I mean the, the Czechs, so no, no, no Russian diaspora. For Russians, uh, more or less, it's clear this is something like civil religion for, for Russians everywhere in, in, uh, all over the world. Uh, uh, the second question is uh, to uh, Mr. Grelka. Uh, 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 you, um, <laughs> you, uh, you, you didn't even mention uh, Vergangenheitsbewältigung uh, in, 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 in your talk about, about the, the Second World War and the past, uh, the, the two, 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 two world wars. Uh, my question is, uh, what was the role of politics of memory in this, this, this practical politics of Germany in these years? And my comments uh, to the uh, talk of uh, um, uh, Mr. Kaminski, Kaminski, Kaminski um, uh, what do you think? So, from, from my vision, this, this myth of, of great patriotic war is part of, of uh, more so broad ideological construct of this founding myth of Russia, uh, of Holy, Holy Rus, uh, and uh, 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 eternal Western threat. And the, uh, the, the Great Patriotic War was, was explained, was treated in Soviet Union from the very beginning, from the time of, of the war, as uh, some, 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 some version of this threat. And that was, was, was uh, very, very easy that to, 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 to explain. So, and in this, this uh, uh, situation, not everyone can be fascist, but the fascists are the, the people from the West who are against Russia. And in this scheme, Barack Obama, for example, can be fascist and Trump, no. 
uh, this uh, no, <laughs> not, not fascist. And Ukrainians are the, uh, the uh, so uh, as as traitors in this scheme, uh, the, 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 the traitors of of Holy Rus, of of us, uh, and uh, on the side of, of of the West. And so, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the question. Are there more questions? We would collect now maybe another one and then, uh, and then let the, the panel answer. Please. Mm. Uh, thank you very much for fascinating talks. Uh, I have maybe a question or a small remark to uh, Alexei Kamensky. Uh, and I think it was very fruitful and amazing. And let me ask you, what do you think about the role of symbolic? in modern uh, Soviet policy and in modern uh, Putinist uh, uh, policy, I mean the symbolic politics, yes, the role of symbols like this uh, ribbons and George ribbon, uh, immortal regiment of course, which started as a private event and very sincere event and then was expropriated, appropriated by the, the, the state as many other symbols, yeah, and the role of something like facade, the role of symbols, fake news, you know, this crucified boy, yeah, like a uh, victim of Nazis, which was all f fake in, in uh, Ukraine, but some people got to, to Donetsk to, in 2014, 2015, b before, before, uh, because, because of these fake and started to fight N Nazis, uh, as they said, in, in Ukraine. And uh, all the symbolic, which is very like magic, like the symbolic comes to, into reality, and finally in the horrible war, yeah? Thank you. So, uh, thank you. We, um, we have questions now. I would add a last question to Peter Rugenthaler because I was thinking of when you presented Austrian politics and the question of neutrality as the history is deeply connected to German history and the relations are very strong and the, the two societies are connected, is the, the politics of Austria or the public opinion of the people towards the, the conflict or the war against Ukraine somehow connected uh, to Germany or does it has nothing to do with each other? This would my, be my question to you. And then I would ask all of you now, maybe beginning with Maria Czerma, um, answering uh, the questions and then afterwards there will be a coffee break. Thank you for the question. I don't think this is a substitute. I think it's something which goes hand in, in hand. It's one package. As if I can refer to the Francoise Tom again, she characterized this uh, new modern comment uh, as, uh, as a group of people who, uh, some, who subvert uh, the, the fundament of European, European identity. So it means people who subvert, who are against NATO, who are against America, and, you, you, and use all the, the, the kind of discourse and the, the, this veneration of, uh, of Red Army is just one aspect of this um, a subvertive uh, <laughs> behavior. Although uh, the veneration of Red Army is not subverted in, in itself, yeah, you know, it becomes suspicious only in these networks of, of this kind of motivation. And if I can comment this, uh, uh, that everybody can be fa fascist, uh, I would specify that, um, that the, 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 who is fascist is the, the person who oppose to someone who fought against fascist. Mm -hmm. So in this way, uh, Czech representatives who removed uh, uh, Konev were fascists because they they are against Konev who fought fascists. So this is, this is the lo logic. As the same logic was uh, definition of counter revolutionaries in '68. Uh, anybody is a counter revolutionist who opposes. Uh, Soviets who came fight against counter revolution. So this is kind of logic. I would say this is similar with, with this fasc fascist history. Okay, here we go. Yeah, thank you for this question. Um, of course, Mikola Borovic, uh, you know, Vergangenheitsbewältigung is something deeply anti revisionist, yes. So, um, but we, we discussed this yesterday after you, your talk. 
uh, Ukraine is really a lacuna of Vergangenheitsbewegung, of coming to, to, to terms to term with the past uh, in, in the German discourse. Yeah, we have a Vergangenheitsbewegung coming to, to terms with Russia, of course, with Poland. So um, this is, um, and of course, we need to we need to um, differ between the societal level level of society uh, coming to terms with the Second World War and. And the war against Russia was, was, of course, more war against Ukraine, as we all know. And the political level, the continuity of foreign policy uh, towards Russia. This, this is here my, um, the main point in my, in my presentation. So there's a, there's a big need of this discourse between uh, Germany and Ukraine. And uh, I hope when German foreign policy now changes after this war, needs to change, turn, needs to t turn into the, the, the European uh, concepts of anti-revisionism uh, uh, in, in foreign policy towards, the, towards Eastern Europe, then there will, everything will be possible. The question is only, will Germany still be the gatekeeper in, over the region, yes? Or is it to be Ukraine? Is it to be Poland? I don't know, yeah, that's, that's, these are all open questions. Should I continue? Yeah. Okay. Um, actually, um, German as well as Austrian policy toward Russian was uh, driven by Vergangenheitsbewältigung, by a memory of the past, of course. Dialogue and cooperation, better than everything else. It is very easy to condemn now Merkel's policy and so on. Um, it's understandable, especially as seen as from most Eastern European countries. It's understandable now. One is, uh, of course, uh, one know much more than uh, a year ago, or in other words, Putin has shown its uh, uh, real face. But uh, now to say um, one must have done already earlier or took uh, other steps. Uh, it would have been simply impossible um, for any German chancellor to take another position uh, towards Russia. I mean, it would have been very easy for the Russian side to condemn Germans in, let's say, after the annexation of Crimea as a totally fascist regime and so on. And this was, uh, in my eyes, um, mainly a reason, uh, of course, for any German politicians, but also for Austrians, um, um, that there was no other way than to try to, yeah, through cooperation and dialogue. And what is so bad about uh, dialogue and operation? Um, uh, of course, now the situation turned out to be totally different, and uh, one has to take a clear stance, if not now, when then, but uh, actually European solidarity shows this uh, very clearly. Um, difference uh, to Germany, at least, um, there were no anti-Ukrainian or any pro-Russian demonstrations anywhere in Austria, although the right wing scene, or that's maybe the, 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 uh, somehow uh, um, not understandable or not reasonable uh, to, to explain why it is the case that uh, the right wing party, which is much more on the, uh, extreme in Austria than in Germany, at least it was within the last 20 years, m now it maybe changes. But I think one main difference is, um, of course, the communist past of Eastern Germany and uh, the, the connections uh, on the left-wing side between, yeah, um, um, or, or the much more pro-Russian um, connections uh, from the at least East German society, um, then this would be uh, the case in Austria. I just gave you the example of the Austrian communists who traveled to Belarus and then and, and to Donetsk and so on, but this is two or three people. Yeah, so that's a huge difference. Thank you, Peter. And last but not least, in the last two minutes that are left, Alex. Exactly. Uh, first of all, uh, Mr. Brovik, thank you for your comment. You are absolutely right. The discourse of a great patriotic war uh, functions as a part of a really more wide discourse. Uh, and for example, if one to take uh, uh, 
uh, Putin's paper uh, on historical unity of uh, uh, Russian and Ukrainian pe peoples, it's all obvious how he uses uh, the series of layers of imperial and Soviet rhetorics uh, referring to Ukrainians as a part of this three un uh, community or as uh, uh, subjects of uh, manipulations of uh, uh, external enemies. Uh, you, uh, I absolutely agree with you, Shalia. Uh, what uh, regards to the war of symbols? It is a huge <laughs> theme, surely, a huge field of uh, problems and uh, research. Uh, well, uh, I take here only one a moment, a moment when uh, one or another object in a uh, uh, urban landscape became a object of a symbolic conflict. For example, uh, the case of Lenin apart in Ukraine, yeah? um, almost neutral part of it, uh, uh, urban uh, l landscape be be became a, a, po a point of uh, conflict and uh, uh, various forms of dissolution of this conflict, uh, for example, from uh, uh, Lenin transformed in, uh, in uh, Darth Vader in Odessa, <laughs> or a uh, Bulgar colonist in uh, Bulgrad in uh, Odessa region, uh, or Lenin apart as, uh, as it is. Uh, some other cases are uh, the case of re-signments, for example, the memorial complexes in Katyn, in Sandarmog, Perim 36, and so on. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Thank you. So, Maria, Frank, Peter, Alexei, thank you very much. Thank you for your attention, and now it's time for coffee. See you back here for the next panel in about 20 minutes. Thank you. In my calculation, we
Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, let's start the fourth session uh, of our conference. Uh, since we have already a 10 minutes uh, long delay, uh, let me welcome our uh, speakers today. First of all, Martin uh, Kratoshvil, um, who studied sociology and demography at Charles University Prague. He works at, at uh, STEM, Empirical Research for Democracy, and in his research he focuses on political opinion, electoral models, and the methodology of quantitative research and data analysis. So it's not a surprise that he will speak about the Czech opinion on foreign countries over the last three decades and the Czech's percep perception of Russian war against uh, Ukraine. So the floor is yours. In today's presentation, as already my four speaker. And thank you. So, sorry. So, as my four speaker already mentioned, I'm going to bring you some. Uh, sort of harder evidence of uh, development of Czech uh, opinions on uh, selected countries. And uh, in the second part of my presentation, I will focus uh, mainly on the development of the uh, opinions on research events, uh, especially uh, and unsurprisingly war and uh, incoming uh, refugees from Ukraine. Uh, what is the opinion of Checks on these uh, topics. Uh, starting with this graph, uh, what you see is the latest uh, installment of our uh, social, soci sociological survey where we uh, ask uh, uh, Czech uh, public to. Um, evaluate their opinion on each country. We select quite a few and they have to uh, mark. Uh, give a mark, give one, two, and five, uh, up to five, where five is the worst and uh, one is the best. What you can see there is an average, and as you can see in uh, October, our latest uh, uh, survey, we see uh, Russia being the uh, uncontested, uncontested uh, worst uh, country in this uh, peloton. And uh, it's uh, really unsurprisingly, again, uh, caused uh, mainly by the events uh, in Ukraine and uh, the perception of uh, Russian actions against Ukraine and against Europe itself. What's important to notice is the second uh, gray, uh, second gray uh, mark, and it's uh, for Ukraine, where you can see that Ukraine is not gaining uh, through war any uh, uh, too much uh, attention and too much love from uh, Czech uh, society. It's just like they are somewhere there, even if we read so much uh, news, so much events, so much uh, happening there, uh, the, the perception of Czech society as a whole uh, is not changing to much better uh, places. Uh, just to uh, mention, there is only one true friend in Slovaks there <laughs> in the, in the uh, first place. And Swiss, Swiss, they are not friends like what we see from other uh, from other uh, surveys. They are more like an etalon, something to look upon, uh, something to solve. So, and here I have selected uh, some major countries, uh, starting from the beginning, from top. There is uh, France, Britain, United States, uh, Germany, and Russia. And uh, what do we see here? It's not uh, the average, but uh, the uh, some of the best, uh, the number one and number two uh, marks uh, given to these countries over the time. What's unique, what we see in STEM, is uh, that this uh, long row starts with uh, the year 1994, uh, and it's. Uh, it uh, spans nearly each year since, uh, so we can see the development of uh, various, uh, various uh, of um, Czech opinion on various countries. Uh, I would like to uh, stop by uh, some uh, some uh, one major event and uh, to see for yourself uh, how to read this uh, long uh, these long uh, threads. So. 
Here we have uh, somewhere uh, in April uh, 2004, there was a major drop down in uh, perception of uh, all uh, Western powers or the major Western powers in uh, the eyes or in the view of uh, Czech uh, population. Uh, I think uh, it might be a little quiz for you. I think <laughs> I'm contested here already, but uh, the events of uh, that year were really important and it is the war or uh, the renewed uh, uh, effort in the war in Iraq. And then you see that this uh, quite um, far away event uh, really uh, had an impact when it happened on uh, the Czech perception of all the NATO uh, coalition members and or all the uh, main powers there. Uh, but uh, what we can see if we follow the, uh, the, the threats uh, further in the time, uh, for Britain, for France and also for Germany, uh, for all of them uh, we can see that they uh, regain their support uh, from the Czech society. It is not the case of United States who continued this war and uh, added also the Afghan war and then uh, we can see uh, that uh, they were not able to recover since. Uh, just another story is Russia or Russia in Czech eyes. Uh, we can see uh, the, uh, we can see the evaluation of Russia in the uh, green uh, lower line there and I tried to, yeah, it is a bit to be seen, uh, to uh, frame it with uh, the main, um, some main events and also the uh, terms of uh, Russian presidents there. So uh, we see that uh, Russia, Russia was seen as mainly as a threat from the beginning. In the 90s, uh, especially with its instability and uh, poor development uh, in Czech eyes, it was still a threat. Uh, what we can't uh, forget is that the uh, Czech Republic uh, became part of NATO and of European Union first in 1999 and in uh, 2004. And uh, until then, until we became a, uh, well in discussion of uh, uh, of uh, um, worldwide alliances, uh, we were a bit afraid or quite afraid of uh, possible, uh, possible uh, influence of Russia or their actions um, possible against the uh, Czech Republic. Uh, there might be much more other uh, layers to uh, tell this story, one of them being that just uh, it's just a few years uh, prior to start of this line uh, where uh, the last uh, Soviet uh, soldiers uh, left uh, the Czech soil. So there is a strong, uh, still uh, lasting strong uh, reminiscence of this um, occupation and also of the events of uh, 1968. Uh, but what we can see, uh, what is the effect of uh, Vladimir Putin on this, uh, on this uh, opinion of, uh, on, or on the position of Russia in uh, Czech's view is that he somewhat stabilized, of mo mostly for his, uh, for his uh, time, for his, uh, all, all of his uh, presidents or uh, premiers uh, or prime ministers' uh, positions, he stabilized the view of uh, Russians in Czech eyes. Uh, it's nothing comparable to our main allies, nothing to, uh, nothing to uh, compare to even Germany or uh, United States. But still, uh, if, you, if we see all the line as a whole, there is quite a happy, <laughs> happy, happy times uh, with his second and third term where he uh, was seen, and also uh, it uh, comes from other uh, researches we do, uh, he was seen as a Russia. What he did, it, develop, uh, it, uh, it influenced also our view on Russia itself. Uh, it's seen with the Medvedev uh, Intermezzo where uh, also the uh, views on Russia uh, were uh, a bit lower and dropped in, uh, like uh, Putin not being as uh, seen and also not present in uh, Czech media. What's too sorry, I think, uh, personally think, uh, about Czech's view on Russia is that also the 
war had to come really close to Czech Republic to really impact our view on Russia. There are those two red dots and they mark uh, Gruzian invasion or war with um, uh, Georgia and also uh, the annexation of uh, Crimea and uh, the events on Donbass. And also there is somewhere there uh, uh, around uh, 2013 there's also actions against in Syria, uh, Russia starting uh, around uh, 2015 meddling there and so we see uh, the, uh, as, as we see, those two years, those particular two years, are missing. But still, if we, see, uh, if we look at the other two years uh, surrounding this, the event might have made some wrinkle, but it faded away very quickly. <laughs> so uh, only it comes when uh, the Russian action some, somewhat uh, interconnects with our internal affairs. Uh, for 2021, uh, the May, where we have the uh, second uh, last uh, point uh, measured, there is, uh, it is just after uh, the actions uh, of Russian, uh, uh, Russians in 2014 uh, with uh, uh, their, like, destroying um, Czech um, um, ammunition depots uh, and uh, where really Czech Russian um, relations started to fall down. Also, the diplomatic relations were frozen. Uh, many diplomats were uh, returned back to Russia, and also Czech diplomats uh, were returned back to uh, Czech Republic. And since then, and it, we can also see it as a summer somewhat of a preparation of the Czech population for the war next year, uh, the, uh, the opinion on Russia started to dwindle. For Ukraine, we have much shorter, uh, shorter row, but still what is here to be seen is that uh, they, same as Russia, the uh, Ukraine uh, is in Czech opinion, seen as some somewhere there, somewhere they they are not affecting us. It's nothing uh, of our concern. Only maybe those who come here and work here and take our jobs and something like that. And most of the years, mo may, maybe all the new uh, new uh, millennia, uh, up until the war, uh, the post-Soviet uh, uh, space was seen as a as one one thing. Like, like in the in the in the mind of or the collective mind of Czech uh, society, it was seen something like, there they come here, buy something here. Uh, they are not our friends. They are not our, any foes. Uh, uh, we really are suspicious towards them, but we uh, do not care about them. And it's also seen uh, in uh, the recent three uh, dots for Ukraine there. If you, we, will, uh, we can see the a bit uh, better uh, perception of Ukraine uh, right after the war, which again started to fade away very quickly, and nowadays it's back to its pre-war state. So, it's for the lines, <laughs> and now to uh, something we can see in a much closer detail, and it is the uh, opinion on uh, Ukrainian refugees coming to uh, Czech Republic and uh, receiving help from uh, Czech state and Czechs. What we can see here, it might seem as some something mediocre. Uh, we see that uh, right after the war, uh, uh, it is um, starting from uh, bottom. Uh, the timeline goes up uh, from uh, early April, where we measured it first, up to that October we measured it last, and we see that outburst of. Uh, solidarity and maybe uh, support uh, just in early April and just after the war, that again normalized very quickly and then what is good in it stays the same. Like even after, uh, even after the harsh uh, autumn and upcoming uh, like really uh, dim outlook for uh, Czech economy er and uh, well-being still uh, the support towards uh, 
Ukrainian refugees is quite substantial. Uh, it's really important to see Czech society as really anti-migrant, anti-refugee oriented. Uh, should it happen maybe five, seven years ago uh, during the uh, refugee crisis, it would be, it might be, much different uh, picture here. Uh, what is really concerning us is the quarter of Czech uh, uh, society that is strongly against help. And it's where the threat of uh, our position may be changing lies. A similar view we see uh, in Czech's uh, position on the conflict itself. So where uh, we uh, have, uh, this is not just a one question, it's a, it's a complex of uh, it's indices and this is the outcome of it. And we see that we here have a majority, again, not a vast majority, but strong majority of uh, people who support the Western view, who are uh, not concerned or, or who do not uh, take the Russian uh, point of view as uh, something uh, to uh, accept the the like the uh, I, I, uh, the, the 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 strong red uh, I do not have it in the in the legend but it they are already on the Russian side but they are really small minority who uh, accept all uh, Russian uh, narratives and who uh, stands for it. So this is really small, but as we see in media in here in Czech Republic, really uh, vocal uh, group who uh, tries to persuade and where the uh, trick lies and where the danger lies, it's the, the orange group who are not yet decided, who do not really take it from Russians and do not really take it from uh, Westerners or European Union or United States uh, either. So this is where uh, we are going to form our future, I think, or we think in STEM. Uh, whether this group becomes uh, somewhat more rowdy and uh, really uh, takes in uh, the narratives of uh, Russian uh, misinformation, propaganda, or also the domestic uh, calls for peace. And the last uh, persistent dream for us was really interesting. What interests me personally very much is where it roots and it is the, in this picture where we see again it's a quite quite a small detail here and uh, I edit uh, the last one we have from uh, pre-war situation it is the Czech debate or public debate is not go with Russia or go with United States or the West but the debate is to stay in our uh, ivory tower to be the bridge, to be the second Switzerland. It's really strong dream here. Uh, I uh, assume that uh, you might be able to uh, uh, support me with many uh, examples that this is not just the case of few uh, last years, but this is something that persists maybe since uh, our first uh, republic, maybe m well over 100 years. Uh, and the debate is to be with the West, to be active in a, in a way, or to be passive, to be the stronghold, to be the, like, the illusion of uh, independence and being independent. So that's all for today from me, and thank you for listening. Thank you very much for this uh, fascinating presentation, which was full of data visualization and uh, timelines. And it was very important, I think, that it showed how uh, Czech public opinion uh, has been changing in a very long uh, term perspective. Uh, and now our ne next speaker will be Professor Juraj Marušák, who is a Slovak political scientist, historian, and also journalist. He works uh, in the Institute of Political Science uh, at the Slovak Academy of Sciences, and he deals with uh, Central and Eastern European history in the 20th and 21st uh, centuries, including European integration, national elections, national I identities, and many, many other uh, subjects. 
Okay, so, uh, uh, dear ladies and uh, gentlemen, the topic of uh, my presentation will be the reflection of uh, Russia in the collective memory of post-communist Slovakia in the context of its aggression uh, against uh, Ukraine. So, um, of course, the uh, outbreak of the so-called Ukraine crisis in 2013, 2014, um, uh, uh, is, um, was reflected also on the uh, re-emergence of uh, political cleavage in Slovakia, which seems to be forgotten since uh, the elections of 1998. It means uh, in the uh, decomposition of the foreign policy uh, consensus uh, especially regarding to the relations with uh, Russian uh, with the R Russian Federation so uh, this is uh, it, it in fact um, a part of uh, Slovak uh, uh, political uh, dispute uh, and um, unlike the situation in uh, the second half of 1990s when um, uh, the this uh, conflict became gradually uh, uh, declined dropped down uh, now we can see the escalation of such conflict uh, initially uh, this uh, dispute uh, how to uh, interpret the events in uh, Ukraine the annexation of Crimea um, the the uh, war in uh, Donbass was reflected mostly on, in the media by the so-called alternative media and uh, or by uh, um, a kind of uh, uh, fringe uh, political parties uh, like uh, People's Party, Our Slovakia, it means an, so-called anti-system political parties. Uh, but however, there was a consensus uh, regarding the non-recognition of the annexation of Crimea, regarding the uh, practical help to Ukraine. However, uh, the uh, first divisions already took place uh, when uh, the issue of Ukraine NATO membership was uh, raised, so uh, the uh, then ruling party, uh, Smer Social Democracy, um, uh, opposed the uh, Ukraine NATO membership. They opposed the policy of sanctions against the uh, Russian Federation, and they also uh, uh, opposed the negative uh, image of Russia, uh, both uh, Prime Minister Robert Fico and uh, other members of his political party, including his uh, later rival, uh, next Prime Minister Peter Pellegrini, uh, uh, several times uh, stressed uh, Russia is not an enemy of uh, Slovakia. So uh, the relations uh, towards Russia became a uh, part of uh, um, uh, political competition, uh, electoral competition before the parliamentary elections in uh, 2020, when uh, just uh, um, uh, Smer uh, and Slovak National Party as the members of the ruling coalition, as well as uh, groups uh, represented by former presidential candidates uh, uh, Stefan Harabin, uh, so-called uh, Fatherland Party, or um, uh, uh, Eduard Chmelar, uh, Socialist SK, Socialist SK Party, rejected the labeling of the Russian Federation as an enemy and um, uh, criticized also the policy of sanctions towards Russia during the electoral uh, campaign. On the other hand, the uh, parties uh, representing uh, that time the opposition, and now since 2020, party is, parties establishing the new uh, coalition, they stressed to strengthen uh, the uh, uh, not only European cooperation, cooperation on the EU level, but uh, also uh, and especially the cooperation on the level of Euro-Atlantic uh, cooperation and strengthening the security ties with uh, United uh, United States. This conflict continued after uh, the parliamentary elections and began to escalate to, to the uh, end of 2021 in the connection with the preparation of bilateral defense agreement with the United States. Uh, the opposition parties described this agreement not only as a, a threat for the sovereignty of uh, Slovakia uh, in uh, terms of security affairs, but also as a step 
towards the war, war against Russia. So the main message of demonstrations uh, at the uh, end of 2021, but also at the beginning of this year, was never uh, organized by opposition parties, was never against uh, Russia, nigdy proti Rusku. So um, this is uh, the uh, one level of uh, this deb debates uh, about Russian Federation, about, about Russia. But um, this uh, issue is uh, not uh, only present in the disputes over the specific uh, kind of foreign policy issues or um, uh, solutions, but also it's um, uh, the part of the debate uh, about the uh, belonging, be belonging of Slovakia either to the west, to the east, and um, uh, also these uh, issues are implicitly included in some so of the so-called uh, mem uh, memory sites, uh, which are uh, crucial in the terms of formation of the identity of the current Slovak. Uh, Republic. Uh, so the source of uh, its legitimacy, it means the elements of tradition to which all uh, political representations of Slovakia um, that have participated in the activities of the government have so far uh, cons uh, consensually sub subscribed are, among others, the traditions of the, of the anti-fascist resistance. Uh, so uh, the anniversary of the Slovak national uprising uh, in to, uh, 29th of August August 1944 is a national holiday of the uh, country. Then also the victory over the fascism uh, in uh, 1945, the 8th of May, is also a national holiday. But also uh, the fall of communist regime and uh, especially also uh, the commemoration of the um, so of the Prague spring, sometimes called also in Slovakia Bratislava, Prague Bratislava spring, um, and especially the day of uh, 21st of August. And uh, also it's, it is commemorated through the person of uh, Alexander, uh, Alexander Dubček. Uh, the uh, key uh, issue of uh, memory conflict in uh, of the memory wars in Slovakia were uh, concerned before on the attitude towards the Slovak state uh, established uh, as a satellite of uh, Nazi Germany and uh, about the evaluation of uh, its uh, president uh, Josef Tiso. This combination of um, the anti-fascist and the democratic leftist traditions, including the changes in 1989, is symbolized by Slovakia by the person of Alexander Dubček, who is one of the of three integrating figures of uh, contemporary Slovak identity. Um, it, it means together with Milan Rastislav Stefanik as a co-founder of Czechoslovakia and uh, Ludovic Štur, leader of Slovak National Renaissance movement. So all these moments, however, are very closely connected with uh, Russia and uh, commemorating these events, these persons, uh, all, um, always uh, one must express uh, their, uh, def define its, uh, his or her attitude uh, toward, towards uh, Russia. So uh, also on the, uh, what are also the main memory tensions in uh, Slovakia are determined by these uh, events. On the other hand, uh, also there is one problem, one issue. Slovakia, uh, together uh, with uh, Czech Republic, adopted the uh, so-called totalitarian um, interpretation of the communist period. Uh, in, according to it, the communist regime was uh, not only not an anti-democratic, uh, totalitarian, it means put on the level, on the same level with the Nazi regime, but also uh, even criminal regime. On the other hand, uh, this commemoration is in a big, deep conflict with the generally uh, positive uh, um, communicative memory on uh, the regime of normalization of the Ch regime uh, ruling in Czechoslovakia since 1969 till 1980. 
nine uh, and, uh, for many uh, people for a huge segment of Slovakia it is uh, still um, the best period of the uh, nation of the national history so uh, this is uh, one of the main conflicts also another issue is the positive uh, reflection of uh, Russia as uh, um, a crucial player uh, patron of uh, Slovak national identity uh, uh, during the period of Slovak national uh, national renaissance so uh, this uh, 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 however, uh, officially, uh, Slovak, um, uh, of officially, this uh, Slovak uh, official collective memory codified by laws was uh, not uh, antagon antagonistic, such as uh, in, uh, for example, Poland or uh, Baltic states. Slovakia rather adopted a cosmopolitan approach, uh, friendly approach uh, towards uh, also towards Russia. Russia. Russian representatives were always invited to the celebration of such national holidays uh, of Slovakia as the day of uh, as a victory day or as. Um, um, uh, the day of Slovak national, Slovak national uprising. Also, uh, uh, Slovakia was uh, several times apprised by representatives of Russia, such as Dmitry Medvedev or Vladimir Putin, for its uh, uh, for the cultivating of, of the memory of Soviet soldiers, uh, for how Slovakia, Slovak Republic cares about the Soviet military, um, about the Soviet military monuments. However, uh, um, in the context of uh, the increasing tensions between Russia and Ukraine in the co and um, subsequently the crisis between West and Russia after the annexation of Crimea, also in uh, Slovakia, uh, um, uh, in the public discourse uh, started to grow the antagonistic approach uh, towards Russia. Russia, which uh, was reflected also on the level of political parties, uh, especially uh, uh, after the uh, since uh, in 2019, uh, the uh, opposition parties, centre-right parties, um, uh, raised the proposal to proclaim the uh, day of the victims of uh, 1968 occupation of Czechoslovakia. It means 21st of August and uh, the day of the departure of uh, occupation uh, troops of the Soviet army from Czechoslovakia, uh, 21st of June, uh, to uh, raise uh, these days uh, to the uh, status of uh, uh, remembrance days of uh, the country. Uh, Central uh, Smer as that, together with uh, Slovak National Party and uh, other, uh, other pro-Russian nationalist parties opposed this proposal. Uh, therefore, uh, these uh, days were recognized as a Remembrance Day of Slovakia only in uh, 2020, and first time they were celebrated uh, in such a way in 2021. But what is uh, more also interested, interesting that this proposal uh, um, uh, to raise this anti-Soviet, anti-communist uh, narrative to the official level was uh, not only opposed by the current opposition, but the current opposition also uh, uh, developed the counter-memory. They raised a proposal to the parliament to commemorate the day of uh, 30th of September, the day of the so-called Munich betrayal to uh, the Remembrance Day, as the day of the betrayal of the Western allies of, the, of Czechoslovakia. However, this proposal was not accepted by the, uh, 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 by the parliament. This... Uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, however, this conflict about the approach towards Russia was also present af immediately after the uh, beginning of uh, Russia's aggression towards Ukraine. It was uh, manifest, uh, manifested in the parliament because uh, um, uh, although the, all, all parliamentary parties, including uh, Smer and uh, People's Party, Our Slovakia, led by Marian Kotleba, it is 
in fact, the neo-Nazi party uh, vote, uh, condemned the uh, Russian invasion uh, to, uh, to Ukraine. However, uh, when um, uh, some prominent representatives of Smer and People's Party, our Slovakia, um, including the deputy party's chairman, uh, Ljubos Blaha and Ladislav Kamenitsky, did not take part in the vote in parliament. They simply uh, were not present in, uh, uh, in the voting. Other, pol uh, other politicians uh, verbally condemned the aggression, but at the same time, they spoke about the responsibility of the West for the war, or uh, they uh, criticized the uh, growing Russophobia or chauvinist approach uh, towards Russia. Uh, only one uh, former presidential candidate, Stefan Harabin, uh, supported the Russian attack on Ukraine, saying, I would do exactly what Putin did with uh, regard to the events uh, of, uh, in Ukraine. For the purposes of today's conference, uh, because uh, that, uh, I don't have enough time, uh, I have identified two key, key historical monu uh, moments that have become the subject of the conflict in the uh, new, em newly emerging or re-emerging uh, geopolitical cleavage in the Slovak society. <gasps> <laughs> So uh, this is the interpretation of the end of the Second World War and of Soviet occupation. So interpretation of the Second World War. So uh, here you, have, you can see the Soviet monument of Slavin. This is a uh, uh, place of the meeting, uh, not only the, meet, the meeting of the pro-Russian political groups in the country, and uh, the place of organizing of political protest, especially after the emerging of the war, organized by the opposition parties now by Smer, Social Democracy. And uh, what's happened with uh, Slavin? This uh, Slavin was painted uh, immediately after the outbreak of the war by, in, uh, in Ukrainian colors. It means uh, uh, on one hand, it is interpreted as the commemoration also of uh, Ukrainian soldiers who uh, were uh, uh, who, who fight it in uh, Red Army uh, for the liberation of Slovakia, and the Russian aggression is interpreted as the uh, uh, <coughs> uh, <coughs> uh, <coughs> the, as the dehonestation of uh, their memory. On the other hand, uh, pro-Russian camp represented it as also as a devastation of the memory on uh, this uh, 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 protests, uh, this uh, uh, paintings on Slavin, graffiti on Slavin, as the dehonestation of memory of Russian soldiers of Red Army. Here you can see the main pro-Russian politician in Slovakia, Ljubos Blaha, the deputy chairman of Smer Social Democracy. Uh, and here is uh, Peter Vidovan. He, it is his nickname on Facebook. And his profile is composed by uh, a picture of Slavin Monument and picture of uh, the uh, Berlin in 1945. Here you can see on, 8th of May, on 9th of May, uh, it is uh, the celebration of the uh, victory over fascism uh, according to uh, Russian Soviet tradition. Uh, there took place a demonstration of uh, the supporters of uh, Ukraine, but you see uh, they were separated from the, demonst uh, from the pro Russian demonstrations. Uh, it, there took place uh, open conflict between these two uh, camps and uh, uh, also uh, supporters of Ukraine in Slovakia described Russian current policy uh, as fascists. It is a response on the Russian accusations of fascism of uh, Ukraine and uh, they invented also this word Russism. Uh, the, uh, especially in the context of uh, Russian war in Ukraine, also several other uh, Red Army monuments were uh, uh, painted on the red or um, uh, damaged uh, by, uh, in Kosice, in Vrano nad Toplou, or they were painted in Ukrainian uh, colors. Uh, all, on the other hand, uh, uh, what about 1968? 
1968, uh, uh, this memory is very difficult to um, uh, establish, to make some revisionist interpretation. However, in Slovakia, it's already uh, in, in progress. So, uh, firstly, uh, the opposite, current opposition parties, especially some representatives of Smer SD, uh, they um, accepted the Soviet communist interpretation, uh, the, the Czech communist interpretation of August 1968, revisionist interpretation according to it, it uh, which uh, uh, the Ukrainians uh, are responsible for the Soviet occupation of Czechoslovakia because the decision was adopted by Ukrainian communist Leonid Ilyich Brezhnev. Uh, this is uh, citing uh, Wojciech Filip, former chairman of Communist Party of uh, Bohemia and Moravia. But uh, also uh, uh, the uh, uh, <coughs> so Ukrainians are responsible for uh, Soviet occupation. Another issue is how to um, uh, uh, how to lighten the image of Russians. So to compare the current situation of Slovakia, the presence of American troops in Slovakia, to compare it with the Soviet occupation. This is a Facebook post of one leader of uh, one uh, Slovak nationalist politician, Anna Belousova. Uh, 54, five, 54 years after 1968, we have here once again the foreign troops. What's the difference? Another interpretation is that uh, any kind of political, any kind of pressures of oppressions against the so-called alternative pro-Russian media are described as a neo-normalization. And uh, if the rep uh, people uh, from the pro-Ukrainian camp are <laughs> yes, please conclude. Yes, I'm going to conclude. Uh, Last sentence. Ukraine to uh, current war to Soviet invasion uh, in 1968. Um, uh, for example, Eduard Chmelar, one pro-Russian politician and publicist, says that uh, Zelensky cannot be compared with Dubček because Dubček would never allow such uh, ca national tragedy of uh, Ukraine. It means he uh, um, uh, says, in other words, uh, Ukraine must capitulate. So the war in Ukraine is escalating uh, the conflict in uh, the Slovak society, and this conflict is uh, uh, already um, uh, <clears throat> has an impact on uh, the crucial uh, moments, uh, crucial issues, uh, framing the current uh, the identity of the modern post-communist Slovakia. Thank you for attention. Yeah, thank you very much for giving us uh, insights into what's happening currently in politics and uh, collective memory in uh, Slovakia. But we are running out of time, so let's move to the next presenter, who will be uh, Reka Sharkozy. Uh, she uh, has been working from 1995 at the Institute, 1956 Institute, um, which do not exist anymore. And currently uh, she works as the head of the photo department at uh, National State Cheney Library, and she is mainly interested in historical documentary films. Uh, so the floor is yours. Uh, yes. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you uh, for the invitation, and it's very nice to uh, sh share my research with you here. The memory of the Second World War is controversial in Hungary, and I would like to show it uh, through three documentary films as an example. Uh, in my paper, I will talk about the memory of the tragic episode of the Second World War, the destruction of the Hungarian Second Army. The months of occupation in the Donbass and the subsequent destruction in the winter of 1942-43 are the subject of several narratives. I will look at the representations in documentary films, focusing on a 1982 Hungarian series, Sándor Sára's Chronicle. Subsequent films have all sought to add to or nuance the content. Despite their intentions, yes, uh, to this day they have failed to undermine 
the dramatic power and credibility of this first one, and uh, thus reinforced its claims and contradictions, not making it any easier to reconcile the memory of the Second World War. The, this absence, unfortunately, indicates that Hungarian society cannot rely on a strong historical vision <coughs> to form a solid position on the war in Ukraine and is vulnerable and unfounded to rumors and deluge of fake news. Yes. The guilty army. After 1945, the overall history of Hungarian participation in the Second World War, any attempted interpretation that deviated from the official historical approach subordinated to Soviet considerations, either in academic works or in publicist literature, became untellable, unwritable. It was also impossible to discuss the experience of the Second World War with those who had lived through it and suffered its consequences. In the 1970s, the situations began to change. The first piece of writing on the fate of the Hungarian Second Army, which was also an attempt to analyze the Don disaster, was Istvan Nemeskürti's uh, Requiem for an Army in 1972, which was, which was of revolutionary importance because it brought the subject of Hungarian participation in the Second World War into the public consciousness. Its publication had certainly been preceded by political consultation, so its content could not have deviated from the canon considered the only acceptable one in the regime. It was a real political sensation in 1978 that the memoirs of the former Colonel General Gyula Kadar, head of military intelligence in 1943-44 were published. It was the first time that the right-wing military officer who had gained an important role in the Second World War through his assignments had received a great deal of publicity. He considered the publication of this work, which was also a new form of historical information compared to previous practice, to be useful in maintaining the rule of the regime at the time. His memoirs had opened up the possibility of a more nuanced historical representation. The political power, by not permitting the story of the Second World War and the participation of the Hungarian army in it to be told without Soviet ideology inevitably shifted the subject towards those who opposed the regime. This has granted the opposition, especially the right wing, the possibility to formulate different narratives. The image of the destruction of the Hungarian Second Army fitted in particularly well with the fields of vision of intellectuals sensitive to the great national tragedies of fate, who felt the nation was under threat and were concerned about its destruction, and who had a long-standing desire to publicly speak their minds about the important national subjects. The breakthrough came in 1982 with Shandor Shara's 20 fine episodes long documentary film entitled Chronicle. The Chronicle was an unprecedented undertaking in terms of film history, as no interview series of this length had ever been produced before or ever since in Hungary. The long supra story has been told with great power, and it has also created a new kind of documentary narrative in Hungary for relating the past. The 40th anniversary of the film's making and the approaching 80th anniversary of the winter of 1942-43 serve as a good occasion to reconsider the manifold meanings and intended and unintended effects of the documentary epic built up from the interviews. The Chronicle comprises 120 interviews, exclusively with former Hungarian soldiers. On the one hand, these statements corroborate each other, and on the other hand, the interviews are cautious in their statements for fear of possible accountability. Their self-control was not unjustified. The episodes were occasionally recut, and the screening time was constantly changed. Furthermore, after the 15th episode, the series was banned permanently, which also played a role in the removal of the current president of Hungarian television, Richard Nagy. Ten years ago, 
The military historian Roran Dombrady wrote a detailed review of the film version of the series, in which he questioned primarily the independence of the creators, thinking from political influences and the historical credibility of the facts embedded in the stories, without disputing or even praising the other merits of the series. In his view, the film series represents the Kadarist position. According to Don Brady, the aim of the filmmakers was not to present the events historically, but to condemn them. He criticizes the film for merely mourning the soldiers, but giving them neither amends nor public recognition for their heroic struggle in desperate circumstances. He therefore considers the film series to be lacking any appreciation of the battles fought and the heroism shown, and perceives its lack of appreci appreciation as a lack of objectivity and professionalism. This need to monumentize the heroic conduct of the army is a recurrent motif in the right-wing frames of the remembrance of Tom Band. The frame of remembrance does not only work according to the intentions of the creator. The same frame may be reinterpreted over time, or it may be interpreted from the beginning in a different way than intended. As proof, I would like to present in detail the most famous episode of the, of the series. This so-called love story led to the banning of the series and the dismissal of the television president. Many people today still see it as a tragically beautiful lyrical episode from the everyday life of war, where everyone is a victim, the Hungarian soldiers and the Ukrainian inhabitants alike. The story is simple. A Hungarian soldier and a Ukrainian, stu Ukrainian school teacher, left alone with her seven children, fall in love, live together, then lose each other. The vivid narrative of Corporal Shandor Gellir, the teacher, and the Transylvanian peasant poet helps us to get a realistic picture of the everyday life of Ukrainian peasants and Hungarian soldiers, which, as this example demonstrates, was by no means without conflict. The Soviets objected that a Ukrainian partisan woman should not be involved in a love affair with the fascist enemy. The Soviet bureaucrats accepted Shandor's view that it was a love story. No one doubted it neither the filmmakers nor the Soviets. This is the narrative that has made it into the history books. No one noticed that the women had no choice. In the introduction to the story, not quoted here but included in the film, it is said that many Hungarian soldiers tried to rape this woman until she got involved with the soldier who told the story. The reason for this, in today's terms, was a sense of responsibility for the children and her own survival, which Shara and the crew interpreted as love. The real victims here are only the woman and another woman involved the story, and the children. The peasant polled soldier who narrates the story effectively is a violent criminal a rapist. Two contradictory readings of the same story. Both are part of historical memory. Many people accuse Shah of being biased of, by silencing the soldiers' war crimes. He does not do this, although these are indeed given less prominence in this film, but sometimes he does not verse. He overlooks the, these war crimes. He does not perceive them. In the example quoted, the folk tale style and the story distracts his attention from its brutal content. But, uh, the primary aim, uh, yes, at, the primary aim of the creators of the Chronicle was to give the fallen the right to a glorious death and the survivors and their relatives the opportunity to mourn their lost ones in the dignity. This was only possible by drawing a morally acceptable picture of the Hungarian Second Army, of those who participated individually and of the army as a whole, so that the virtual tomb or memorial that had been missing until then could be built. The discussion was only possible right by reinforming the positive elements. Furthermore, the elements of personal stories inevitably build up a myth, which is only reinforced by the fact that it contrasts with the canonized, solely valid, unequivocal, and totally condemnatory official position of the army, which was created under external pressure and which described the army as fascist. In the communist explanation of history, political judgment went hand in hand with undifferentiated moral judgment, one of the means of communication of which was silence. 
Shara and his crew wanted to refuse this judgment through the series, but they could only do it carefully. Nor could they ignore the fact that this army was an ally of the German fascist power, and there was no excuse for that. There was only one possible narrative of this role for them too. Hungary was on the wrong side in the war, and Soviet Union represented humanity as compared to Nazi Germany. In this respect, they accepted the Kaderist canon, dictated also by their own anti-fascist convictions and not just their fear of censorship. They strove for objectivity so that several frames of remembrance operate in parallel in the series, the inescapable Kaderist and the permissive victimhood that became the starting point of the later right-wing narrative. Shara's series was considered biased to such a great extent by his contemporaries that in 2003, the cameraman and the director, Peter Erde, made a counterpart to the Chronicle, interviews with the local population along the river done about the memory of the Hungarian army. The title of the work, Don it Tucker, Don Mirror, could also be interpreted as the mirror held to the Chronicle, although the author probably used the metaphor in a broader sense. <coughs> He only listened to one party, the victims, but very late, 60 years after the events. Instead of myth-making, he wanted to deconstruct an already established image by drawing on more recent oral history sources. Erdély fears that there is a deliberate silence about the daily wartime activities of the Hungarian Second Army, the atrocities and executions that took place. He wants to break this silence and force a confrontation with the past. The film's most prominent themes are the descriptions of looting, robbery, tie-ups, beating, and unjustified murders. All, all of this delineates a vulnerable army abandoned for long periods of time, living through extreme situations and a period of forced coexistence in which everyone was dependent on everyone else, on the military commands and operations, Hungarians on the Germans, Ukrainians on the Hungarians. His obvious bias, however, weakens his credibility and does not form a coherent picture of the war. The heroic army. After 1990, anti-communists became the core of conservative right-wing discourse. All communist claims were subject to revision, with the perception of war becoming an important topic. According to this view, Hungarian history is a series of tragedies. The Hungarians are mostly victims, who have been thrown into the war, who have been drifted into it, and are not responsible for the crimes of others. This moral exemption can lead to a relativization, or even a revision of the war. The controlled content of the Chronicle inadvertently set the stage for this interpretation. In addition to, to the Kadarist narrative, there are already traces of a new one, which later became dominant on the political right, the past is identical with the history of the suffering of Hungarians. This approach is represented by Janusz Litowski's documentary film Over the, uh, at the Distant, Over, Over the, at the Distant Dawn, made 10 years ago. The filmmakers traveled to the locations of Uriv, Szczucie, Storozhenoye, Puchowo, Korotoyak, the Hungarian military cemetery in Hrutkino, and the film's military experts and military historians were interviewed at the original locations. This is a cinematic military memorial which highlights the positive human deeds and the losses suffered, and it is clearly devoid of any motives and could destroy this memorial. This film fills the gap Dombra dimensions, bringing heroism into the historical memory. However, the film omits the abuses, destructions, and war crimes committed by the Hungarian army. Documentaries can be used to create a so-called foundational stories. Something is needed, a value, a historical reference point, the continuity of which can later be used as a basis of conscience of Hungarian society, and from which a new common set of values can be developed. These three examples clearly show that the Dom Band, and with it the Hungarian involvement in the Second World War, exists in several possible frameworks which are difficult to reconcile. The last time the Chronicles succeeded in doing this was in 1982, but as the example cited shows, it made serious compromises. Two. 
placing the story of the Stone, uh, Don disaster in a frame of remembrance that is still disputed today. Hungarian society is not aware of its own role in the past, and its memory of the Second World War is uncertain, a situation increasingly compounded by a lack of historical knowledge and distance in time. Unfortunately, Hungarian historian uh, memory represented in documentary films offer no clues to the equally complex contemporary wartime com uh, conflict, the conflict in Ukraine. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much for this important presentation which highlighted uh, important uh, memory patterns in Hungary. And let's move now to our last speaker, uh, Valeria Korabiova. Uh, she's affiliated now uh, with the Institute of International Studies at uh, Charles University Prague, but basically she's a professor uh, of philosophy at uh, Taras Shevchenko National University of uh, Kiev, and she focuses on European integration, the legacy of 1989, and the history of uh, independent Ukraine. Thank you so much. Um, many thanks to the organizers, to Dr. Tuma and Dr. Divatova for, for the kind invitation, and many thanks to my distinguished colleagues for all these very enlightening uh, discussions and presentations. So we have been touching upon Ukraine, but now I suggest to, to zoom in and to look what's been happening in Ukraine directly. And what I'm trying to say, I'm not coming from the perspective of uh, memory studies, but I'm coming from the sociological perspective. So the idea is not about the memories and different policies like inside the Ukrainian society, but more like how Ukrainians tackle the issues of history and memory altogether as they are entangled in the relations with Russia. And what I'm trying to do in my presentation is to counter the very well present in media narrative of the sort of rising nationalism in Ukraine ever in the post-Soviet times, which the increasing level of Russophobia, which allegedly triggers some reaction on the Russian side. And what I'm trying to argue instead is basically that Ukrainians have found themselves repeatedly in the position when some historical argument uh, have been weaponized against them and and they were trying to find solutions and they have been trying to find different ones so i will suggest a sort of broad and therefore sketchy overview given being very short of time as i'm the only person standing between you and lunch sorry about that uh, so I will try to suggest you an overview how Ukrainians have been trying to, to face the Russian threat looming on the horizon for quite a while, but most explicitly since the annexation of Crimea, and what kind of different approaches to the past and to the history as a political weapon have been uh, devised there. So, like to give you a context, I'm pretty sure that you are well aware of this infamous article already mentioned today that by the presenter on the previous panel on the historical unity of Russians and Ukrainians. Uh, it was largely ignored in the political and international relations community as irre irrelevant, as sort of um, quite a quirky, like exotic hobby of a Russian president, but like not taken seriously as a warning sign towards a big war, right? But if we look at that, and I'm referring to that because the main tropes already articulated by Putin last year have been repeated many times as the justification for the war on the uh, this infamous speech on February 21st uh, preceding the full-scale invasion the same arguments and even if the informational warfare is much more diverse and even Putin himself has shifted recently to what's like playing with the global south but even like listening to his speech on the recent Valdai Forum, when the official speech was very much like decolonial sort of leftist leaning vocabulary, adapting it to please the global south. But then, if like listening to the Q and A session, this like big one, which was not translated into other languages on the presidential website, then we see we hear exactly all the same tropes already. Uh, given to us basically on the plate last year. So what were they? Uh, it's a very specific sort of historical teleology when he overtly says that basically the future is defined by the past. So to have a better understanding of the present and look into the future, we need to turn to history. 
The second one is that Russians and Ukrainians are one people, and this unity is defined by common language and common faith. So it's basically Russian and Orthodox community or polity, as you wish. Um, if Ukrainians somehow are not aware or do not wish to recognize this unity with the Russians, that's because they were poisoned into some, uh, by some conspiratorial agents into thinking that they are different, and therefore it is called, like, independent Ukraine is basically the anti-Russia project. And it is not originating from Ukraine specifically, but from uh, Polish, Hungarian uh, uh, aristocracy, Western conspiracy, whatever. You name it, different, like, versions are there, but, but the bottom line is that Ukraine could exist only as part of Russia. And you see some quotations uh, in the brackets. So that was something which was ignored not only by the international community, but by the Ukrainians himself, because it's something absurd and, and uh, you do not really know how to tackle that. However, uh, after the beginning of the full-scale invasion in February this year, when it became clear, like several weeks into that, that uh, the, ble the Blitzkrieg failed, that Kyiv did not fall in three days, and that basically the Ukrainian people do not wish to surrender to the Russian world, then the rhetoric becomes even harder. And here I'm quoting another infamous essay, which could be ignored, it's not by Putin, but by Timofey Sergeyev, but it was published on the official resource RIA Novosti. And that was even more explicitly genocidal in its rhetoric, and I see Russian colleagues nodding, uh, hopefully disapprovingly, to the statements, but approvingly to my points. So, uh, what is suggested here again, so that's like just another stage of denazification, because now the war is just a sort of denazification which took a practical turn. Which means we should give up on the idea that only the Kyiv authorities are bad but Ukrainian people are good, but basically they're all bad and therefore they need to be extinguished. Which is called total lustration. Um, then this process, given the level of resistance in the Ukrainian society, this process will take not three days, but more than one generation lifetime, and it should be carefully guided. And a very nice caveat suggested that basically, yeah, you should not have any mercy because the tragedies and dramas of the wartime benefit the peoples who have attempted and carried away by their role as the enemy of Russia. And again, reiterating the same point that history has proved that it is impossible for Ukraine to exist as a nation state. And uh, uh, he goes as far as to say that Ukrainian version of Nazism presents a bigger threat to the world than the Hitler version of Nazism. Uh, now think again, we are not talking about the quality and the grounds of this argument, but I, let's like try to adopt it for a second, the perspective of the Ukrainians, like, like reading all that and hearing all that, like how you should react to those statements. So a bit like rolling back to Ukrainian responses or versions of responses, because the previous, like what I just presented, used like a context, the more recent one, but now I'm humbly reminding you that the war has been going on for eight years. It started uh, in 2014, and there were several versions how to respond to these historical ground, grounds or sort of um, rhetorical attacks, not like supplementing uh, the military ones. So the first version was the presidency of Pyotr Poroshenko, Petro Poroshenko, who was trying to be very anti-colonial and who tried to engage in historical wars and he tried to prove that basically like Putin arguments are wrong, so basically trying to engage and to play on this field. So um, he was very explicitly anti-Russian in his domestic and uh, foreign policy alike. Um, I will talk about it a bit later. And then uh, Zelensky, like two stages of Zelensky before and after the full-scale uh, invasion. Okay, so Poroshenko. He chose sort of fixing the past as the sort of the backbone of his state policy. Uh, and, and he was very proud and certain achievements that were the decommunization laws, like a package of laws passed in 2015, gaining Thomas, giving some autonomy to the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, and uh, continuing some like dismantling Soviet monuments, so basically erasing the signs of the historical memory in the streets and in the names. And uh, I'm suggesting you some visual support 
reports in the presidential campaign of 2019, you can clearly see that the main slogan was away from Moscow, which is like very like decolonizing or sort of anti-Russian. Uh, the package was like army, language, faith, and he was like directly building his public image against Putin as a rival challenging Putin as the only solution against the Putin's threat. As we all know, it failed. It did not meet the support, but it felt in a very interesting way because it was like welcomed by a quarter of Ukrainian society, a very active part of the Ukrainian society, but the majority was very cautious about this sort of radicalizing, very like, let's say, right wing with a caveat. I can explain if, if we have time for Q&A. Uh, so what people opted again, uh -huh, okay, it's the, about the reception. I included that just like a, an illustration, uh, half a year into the war, September 2014, um, you can see that the attitude of uh, Ukrainian population towards uh, civic symbols of the national identity like the flag and the anthem has improved. The attitude to Ukrainian nationalists has not changed. The attitude to Russian state has worsened and the attitude to the Russian culture and Russian language has not changed. So that kind of sets the framework of the majority of the population that tends to think that like Putin is bad, the Kremlin is bad, that the Russian culture is not, uh, and uh, being still very cautious about like nationalism in its like ethno-nationalist um, right-wing incarnation. Uh, so they instead overwhelming landslide victory of Zelensky. And if we look at another sociological poll in 2019, when people were asked what were the main challenges the president was expected to tackle, then they say basically that the main challenge was to, to stop the war. And that was the main electoral promise of Zelensky. So this is over 70% over of the electorate said basically that we want the war to be stopped. And however, it's not about the Euro integration or improvement of relations with Russia or symbolic politics or historical policies. All major positions were about raising the standards of living, lowering the utility costs, improving the quality of medical service, so very much like domestic issues. So what the society voted for, it was not like a pro-Russian stance or pro-European stance, but basically just like to live in better and not engaging in historical wars altogether. That was the demand that Zelensky was stepping into. And uh, analyzing the electorate uh, of two main rivals in the presidential election of 2019, you would see that people who were for the hard stance of Russia overwhelmingly supported Poroshenko. However, Zelensky managed to capture different parts of the electorate, both those who were like for hard stance of Russia and those who were not really. So what Zelensky did when he was elected? Uh, he tried to, to step away from historical wars, from memory wars, and, and uh, he, in his New Year's address on 2020, he said that basically, we want to live in the country where the name of the street does not matter, because it is lit and paved, where it makes no difference at which monument you are waiting for the girl you love. So that's a very poetic way to phrase the idea that basically historical policies, language policies, that's all, like all these symbolic games are not that important. We just need to, to live properly, and that was exactly tapping in the moods of the electorate. So he was trying to articulate very like non-ideological visions for the country's future. Uh, and of course, we, like, those who follow the Ukrainian politics, you remember this promise that one just stop, needs to stop shooting and we can always meet in between, right? So that was the main electoral promise. However, his version of public rhetoric was very much, had a very special tonality, and I believe that was the main thing which made him very successful. First, domestically, but now arguably on the global arena with his speeches, because what he's doing, uh, he's trying to, to invoke positive emotions in people who listen to him. So repeatedly over the years of Zelensky presidency, you can see repeating tropes with very positive emotional uh, signification. He talks about unity, he talks about hope, he talks about future, he talks about children, sort of invoking always some positive emotions. And that is omnipresent. And how and I want to mention that it worked. Because if we look uh, into sociological data from 2019, uh, you don't need to go into details, but what I mean here that basically um, 
there are very rare moments in Ukrainian uh, situation after 1991 when people are optimistic in the, about the future. And definitely Zelensky managed that. So with this sort of uh, positive rhetoric, he made people believe that we are moving towards a brighter future. And he uh, still has the level of support uh, which no, no, no previous uh, president of Ukraine enjoyed. And uh, it's not only when being like directly asked do you believe that the country is moving in the right direction? And people say yes, you can see in August 2019. But I also include here a very interesting index of um, consumer moods. So people invest in the future. People stop leaving the country and they start investing. So they, they do have expectations in a better future and they invest their money into that. So they prove it in their like, sort of actions, not only with statements. Um, Mixed policies of Zelensky. So basically what he was trying to do, and I'm talking before the big war, that he's tried to one-sidedly quit memory wars with Russia, discursively reconstruct a cleavage between like Russia, good Russian culture, good Russian people, and evil Kremlin trying to achieve its goals. Uh, he promoted tolerance to Russian cultural production and Russophone production, both allowing uh, Russian, um, let's say, cultural agents, different performers to, to come to Ukraine with their presentation, but also allowing all like different TV shows, different cultural products to be broadcasted on Ukrainian television. And interestingly, how he managed historical policies, he adopted this sort of accommodating historical policies where the canon of national history was mixing national and Soviet tropes all together that are representative to his own, I believe, personal breeding, but also representative of uh, many people's perception of what is like contemporary Ukraine. And a good example would be, I will not be showing it, but if you are interested, you can look at this uh, short video. It's 10 minutes. It is called History of Ukraine in 10 Minutes. And it was broadcasted on the Independence Day of Ukraine last year. And it presents a very interesting, yeah? A very interesting, yeah, at least I'm, I'm looking at you, <laughs> waiting for the signal. Uh, so um, it presents some specific uh, reference points that are included in the Zelensky government, the Zelensky presidency version of national history, and many points are omitted there. And, and Russian and Soviet atrocities are also like mitigated to the, any possible extent. So it is a very interesting uh, version of national history which could be constructed because it's, it's multi-layered and interesting in many ways. Um, okay, so what changed recently? So coming from this perspective that people and the president alike did not want any escalation and they were trying to downplay the historical uh, rivalry with Russia, these contested memories, but then they found they in the position of the full-scale invasion, which I call a zero point. And I would argue that uh, it changed a lot in the perception of the Ukrainians because in a way it is perceived as a such a big scale of a historical event that makes all the previous history irrelevant. So it doesn't matter what happened in the past because we are living now through something of the, such like an extraordinary scale that there are no doubts who is bad and who is good in this story. So we do not need to go to the history because it simply doesn't matter any longer. And, um, and this feeling of living through history, of history in the making, when you clearly see who is the aggressor and what his actions and his, strat his strategies are, it somehow it, it, it just like um, closes many issues, let's say. And, um, and that, that was met like ambiguously, like I, I would probably underline in the very scarce remaining time, just two main points. <laughs> One would be Zelensky and his, uh, and his global rhetoric, which is very much still on that sort of positive mobilization side. So as opposite to Poroshenko, he does not speak about Putin at all. And he's not even speaking about that much about like um, Russian injustice rooted in history, but he's trying to, to scale up the conflict or this, the war in Ukraine as something of global relevance, that we are in that together. And let's somehow tackle this issue together to move into the brighter future. So that's kind of the framework he's trying to, to promote to, to a large extent, trying to delocalize that conflict and to, to try to put some, uh, given the awful context, but still some positive accents here and there. So that's kind of uh, Zelensky's strategy. Whereas there is um, 
quite uh, like expected and not surprising at all uh, radicalization on the ground a lot of like uh, anti-colonial movement in ukrainian society uh, I see another wave of language conversion when people uh, convert into Ukrainian. We had like several waves, but now it is like, so basically like to put it simply, and I'm sure you have heard this, that Russian rockets, they killed any like sympathy to Russia much more efficiently than any previous presidents or policies we were able to do. So now we have uh, a lot of initiatives that are not coming like uh, top down from the government, but more coming from the society and from the activists. You see for instance just like two examples this cancel russia so many like activists are trying to say that you cannot basically disentangle the russian government from the russian culture and the russian society and trying to show how it works uh, and with many examples and many performances in in, in many areas and just one example uh, some of you may know Serhi Jadan, um, a writer from Kharkiv, recently awarded the peace prize um, at the book fair in germany so he is now making this flash mob he's just making selfies with monuments to pushkin in different towns of ukraine and the next day these monuments get dismantled so if we had like lenin a class we had lenin a fall which was mentioned before so now it goes like deeper in, into history so it's not about the soviet legacy but now it's about the imperial legacy even like about more ancient times so now be, and, and a lot of controversies around the the monument to the catherine the great in odessa which is now uh, expected to be dismantled but it was vandalized you see it so so these like different types of treating the, the monuments, some of them are being protected from the shelling, uh, as in this installation uh, depicts us, you know, this covered with the bags with sand so that they are not destroyed by the shelling and some of them are expected to be dismantled. So to conclude, um, this one falls on many levels. But also interesting, uh, I would say, on this sort of temporal dimension, because sometimes it is perceived as a war between the past and the future. There is a strong feeling in the Ukrainian society that Russia wants to drag Ukraine into the past, and once you engage talking on whatever side, who is right, who is wrong, you, you lose, because you are like in a reactive position. So basically, the, the common sentiment in the Ukrainian society is just like to close the past and to try to solve the situation in the present. And Russia is the threat. It needs to be somehow eliminated and then we need to step into the future which would not be defined by Russia and therefore the attitude to symbolic politics is a bit ambiguous and, and we need to develop some nuanced approach here a combination of post-colonial and anti-colonial move I would say but what is like truly interesting and that would really would be the closing point on my side uh, we are living now in the age of the identity politics, right? So the populism on the rise and many, many actors and many politics, uh, polis, polities are trying to, to defend their identity, articulated in various ways through different markers. What is quite uh, striking in the Ukrainian case today is that uh, Ukrainians build their identity today around the idea and the concept of democracy. And the recent research by Olga Onuk and Henry Hale proves that, that Ukraine stands in the first place as an unexpected case with a huge strike in rise of the support to democracy. But then if you complement it with some like qualitative research asking people like what it means, they basically perceive it that what is different between Russia and Ukraine, it is the political culture. And, and what, what we are defending is our right to define our future. And, and therefore, it's not about the rulers, but it's about our like, uh, ability to have an influence of the design of the polity. And therefore, that's a very like, peculiar version of identity politics built around the idea of democracy. And I'll stop here. Thank you for your attention. Yes, thank you very much uh, for your attention and also for um, all of the speakers for these fascinating presentations. Uh, and our lunch break has theoretically started already. So I just propose uh, to probably organize one round of, of questions, uh, if you are fine with that. Uh, so I would like to now open the discussion for questions, comments, uh, remarks, uh, if you have any. Um, yes, we have. Wow, I would say wow, I'm really overwhelmed by all these very interesting themes. Just 
And I would like to thank you to Yurai that he tackled the, the theme I failed to tackle in my, in my presentation. I just want to pick up one, one little subject uh, and ask Va Valeria. Uh, you talked about these grassroots reactions and um, that there is the, the mockery and humor used by this. But uh, as we uh, look at the, 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 the war, uh, we see that this is also on the official level, the, this mockery note and the, the, the humoristic, uh, you know, around the president and in, in the official statements, we can find it which we like. <laughs> I think, and I would like to ask whether this is something that comes with uh, Zelensky and his entourage, or is it something more uh, deep, just something more rooted in the Ukrainian culture? Yeah, that's that's it. Yeah, let's let's collect uh, the questions. Burkhard Osowski also has some. Yes. Thank you for all your presentations. Uh, I have a question to uh, Martin Kratofil and later on to Reka Reka Rakoshi. Um, hmm? Oh, just, uh, Rakoshi was a dictator. Sorry, 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 uh, Reka, sorry. she's not a dictator. <laughs> well, it was the wrong name. <laughs> I do apologize. <laughs> well, the Hungarian language is somehow complicated. Uh, um, yeah, thank you for the, the data which you gave us, uh, which were very convincingly. Uh, I would like to ask you, well, which importance has, um, well, the past, or in particular the, the Czech Soviet past and uh, the, the invasion of Russian troops in, in 1968. Um, do you have also data uh, of, of, of different generations, uh, or can, can you give you, us some insights how these data or their attitude uh, towards Russia is somehow connected also with, well, the contemporary history? And uh, to Reka, uh, well, I really was fascinated by, <laughs> by your presentation, but I didn't know much about this, uh, probably like many other ones, uh, although the fact that uh, Hungary was involved uh, in the uh, well, in the war against the Soviet Union on the side of, of the Wehrmacht. Um, actually, I would be interested how the Ukrainian historians uh, reacted on these, your research, or were there also before some interests from the Ukrainian side to put an eye on these, well, on these uh, engagement of the second Hungarian army and is there still a place of dispute between Ukrainian and Hungarian historians or is there a field of well common research from both sides so that would be the question to you <laughs> okay thank you very much if you don't have any uh, questions more, uh, uh, please, yeah, 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 please uh, uh, answer the questions and uh, let's do it in an inverse order. So let's start with Valerie. Okay, yeah, thank you so much for your question. Uh, it's a good one because um, Ukrainians have very, so it's not connected to Zelensky, it's other, the other way around. The Zelensky became popular because he tapped into that. So if we look uh, in the sociological data starting from 1991, what are the, the most popular TV shows in, 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 for the Ukrainian audience, that would be overwhelmingly the comic content all sort of comic show. And, and, and then we can like sort of deconstruct that, like how it works and why it is the case, but definitely that is, uh, humor is a political tool uh, in Ukrainian society and that has been the case for, for a while. But talking about the, um, the beginning of the full-scale invasion, I believe that this avalanche of different memes and jokes and the way to tackle and very, serious situation with a dose of humor that was a powerful on the grassroots level. So of course you see the official speeches, right? So a lot of these like grassroots things are under the radar. But I believe that many, many cases of people uh, laughing in the face of 
the Russian invaders were signifying uh, the willingness to resist. It's one of the ways to resist if you're not scared of the aggressor. And, and if I can, like following up a question, are we allowed to ask questions among ourselves or no? Yeah. Sure, okay. Um, yeah, I wanted just like to ask you quickly why Ukraine was put on, on the questionnaire only in 2014, given the amount of Ukrainian diaspora in Czech Republic. And the second one, do you have also qualitative uh, research complementing the data? Because I'm, I'm, I'm personally very much uh, fascinated with this Switzerland dream in Czech Republic, what it really means. Is it like the small nation sentiment that we do not want to care about geopolitics, or is it about that economy is more important than politics? politics and symbolic politics. Well, it's a difficult question because I'm not a political historian, I'm a film historian. Uh, I, but I know that uh, in this first uh, well-known adaptation, the Russians were not asked. So it was just a Hungarian point of view in Shara's Chronicle in the 1980s. Uh, but under the uh, depression of the Soviet official point of view, of course. There is one historian, a Ukrainian, and I can't uh, quote his name, unfortunately, but he is an interviewee in both later films, and he talks about the perspective of the Ukrainian uh, uh, inhabitants and locals, but there is no connection between the Hungarian researchers and the, hung and the Ukrainian uh, uh, historians. I think it's, 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 it's still a... Uh, uh, lacking uh, something, you know. So that, uh, I, I think that's the answer. <laughs> Yurai, would you like to comment on something? Um, so uh, uh, it's difficult to to comment comment it. So, but um, okay, I don't have any comment. Yeah, sure. So, Martin, please. So, or not, yeah, thank you. Thank you for both your questions. Uh, yeah, thank you both for your questions. Uh, for uh, your question regarding the, um, the impact of uh, our common history with the uh, Soviet invasion and here and staying of uh, Soviet troops, uh, I think it's a field where I think uh, our sociological research should meet uh, some insights and inputs from uh, historians and from uh, historical science so to complex it together. As, uh, for the second, uh, so, so for me it's I can put there some interpretations, uh, but I would need uh, some uh, more thorough historical compass uh, to uh, get the input uh, right and uh, also to have the interpretation um, like uh, anchored in uh, historical paradigms. Uh, but to your second question or the second part, uh, the difference is uh, uh, the main difference is uh, 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 shaped around the uh, the age the age is really the factor here and it uh, is a uh, quite interesting because uh, of its shapes uh, you here like where uh, you uh, the generations with a vivid uh, memory of the um, the invasion itself of the uh, 68th uh, um, Invasion or the or the start of the uh, of uh, normalization, uh, they tend to uh, be more anti-Russian and hel uh, hold uh, they hel uh, they hold the uh, some grudges more more uh, serious grudges towards Russians. There are these uh, really live on uh, or those that have been lived uh, through uh, the years. Uh, so they even if it uh, like fades away as we go uh, closer to uh, present day, uh, it's still uh, being shown in the generations starting nowadays around 55, 60. Uh, these uh, people who has this vivid uh, memory of uh, those sections, uh, they tend to uh, Despise maybe even uh, Russians more, uh, but then the the like the middle generation starting somewhere around 30s uh, to those 55s or middle uh, 50s, uh, these uh, are more 
like content with uh, Russians or maybe even not content but uh, less caring about them. But then again, uh, the youngest generations, this is the other part of the EU I mentioned, uh, they also uh, maybe through uh, uh, knowledge uh, from uh, schools or maybe also from recent actions of uh, Russia, they tend to uh, uh, give uh, also uh, lower uh, or the higher in this case uh, some, uh, marks and uh, be more critique to uh, uh, Russia. And to uh, is it is it uh, is it that what uh, you are trying to proceed? And uh, for your questions, I. Um, I really don't know why it happened uh, that uh, the uh, Ukrainian uh, Ukraine as itself was added uh, in uh, 2013 lately. I, I might assume it was uh, where there was some pinnacle of uh, uh, Ukrainian workers coming from uh, Ukraine to uh, uh, Czech Republic, but I really can't say what, what uh, my predecessors uh, were led by to at Ukraine just in 2013, um, and uh, I'm really sorry, <laughs> but uh, for, for you, your Do you yeah, that, yeah, like yeah. Uh, m I personally think that it's something, uh, and I really need to support here from uh, historians that it's something that uh, is really. Uh, present in Czech and maybe Slovak uh, uh, to uh, the, the um, like the the common narrative or the something that we uh, feel like uh, right way to get or right position to get into. Uh, I think most likely from the uh, the end of the uh, of uh, the Second World War with. Uh, uh, strong position of uh, Edward Benesch, uh, f uh, former president of Czech Republic, who really tried to uh, formulate this politics uh, around uh, throughout his life, uh, even before and even after the war, uh, like to position ourselves, like being this Swiss lake, some some Swiss mountain, some something like we uh, envelop ourselves in this uh, blissful ignorance and. Uh, great peace, uh, which is, uh, I personally think it's a really dangerous dream, like nowadays it really shows uh, when um, uh, Russian uh, misinformants and uh, domestic, uh, uh, um, domestic uh, pro-Russian uh, forces, they really use this narrative. As we have seen on, on the picture, there are not many people tending towards east, so the main narrative of uh, these forces is let's stay uh, peaceful, do not support anyone, we are here and we will stay calm and uh, for ourselves and it's really just tackling this vast mass of people who really likes the uh, imagination, uh, image, uh, image of Czech Republic being uh, really neutral which is just a false dream in our case. Okay, uh, just only a uh, short remark. Uh, this position uh, to be of being somewhere in between the West and the East is also very typical uh, and most uh, widespread geopolitical stance of uh, Slovaks. And uh, um, I think uh, it's uh, very interesting that it has not changed, uh, changed too much, even after almost 20 years uh, of, B of uh, EU and NATO membership of uh, our countries. So this is also very typical how much it's stable. And regarding the young people and their attitude, for example, to the 1968 events, uh, uh, the, uh, also a huge portion of them simply uh, has no idea about it. This is also very uh, widespread uh, response. I don't know, have uh, exact, exact data, but uh, uh, this year was published um, a survey uh, regarding it. Okay, thank you. Let's continue our discussion during the uh, lunch break. So thank you very much once again for Man Martin, Jura, Ereka and Valeria uh, for their excellent contributions and also for your attention. Thank you.
So, dear friends, I would start the last panel. We have four last papers, four last presenters. It seems to me that we will play power play. Uh, not so many people in the audience, but maybe some other people will join us. So definitely we will start right now. The first speaker is Burkhard Olszowski, who works in the Federal Institute for Culture and History of the Germans in Eastern Europe which is in fact a very historical topic. Um, uh, <coughs> the institute is based in Oldenburg. No, Burkhard Olszewski is a historian and he is specially focused on German-Polish history, German-Polish relations, published a book about the uh, relations between former GDR and, and uh, People's Poland. And among other things, if I'm not wrong, 2011 to 2013, he was a secretary in Warsaw um, in European Network Remembrance and Solidarity. That's, I think, since those times we have known each other. So please, uh, Burkhardt, um, your, your paper is about German Ostpolitik Reconsiderate. Please, go on. Yeah, thank you, Aldrich, uh, for the nice introduction. Yes, uh, I will speak uh, about the uh, German Ostpolitik, reconsidered question mark. The invasion of Ukraine uh, on 24th February this year led to a deep shaking and questioning of certainties in the European states, but also. but also in the world. Um, what are the consequences of this historical turning point for the Federal Republic of Germany and the Eastern policy, the Ostpolitik? Uh, in order to give a cursory answer to this question, I would like to take a closer look to the German's Ostpolitik and the older, more recent German stands toward Russia and Ukraine. Before at the end I come to some conclusion. Let me begin very briefly describing the history and the emergence of German Ostpolitik. Remarkably, uh, the, the West German Ostpolitik had one of its most important origins in the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962, which can rightly be described as a caesura in world history. The political scientist Richard Löwenthal, who was at that time teaching as a professor for political science at the Free University in West Berlin, linked the outcome of the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962 with the Berlin Crisis a year before, and came to the following conclusion. The consequences of the war was a consolidation of the Soviet status quo in Central Europe, and the consequences of the missile crisis in Cuba was a consolidation of the Western position in world politics, including the position in West Berlin. The turn towards polit world political detente still initiated by Kennedy and Khrushchev take place on this basis. On the German side, the new Ostpolitik was independently uh, linked with the first social democratic chancellor of the Federal Republic, Willy Brandt. And a narrow sense of the world German Ostpolitik aimed to achieve a balance with the Soviet Union and the East European states, and ultimately to overcome the status quo, in particular through politically and economically conceived principle 
of change through reapproachment, Wandel durch Annäherung. In the late 60s and in the half of the 70s, securing of European sphere of interests was also for, of importance for the Soviet Union. It created an important point uh, later on for the treaties with Eastern European states and for the adoption of the KSZE final act in Helsinki 1975. 25 years after the Second World War, German's Ostpolitik also had an important content of understanding, even reconciliation, which was fruitful vis-a-vis -vis Poland and Czech Czechoslovakia or GSSR, and removed the image of a revengeist West Germany that had been propagated for decades in Warsaw and Prague and thus also an important source of legitimacy for the communist leadership, in particular in those both countries. But then we, you can distinguish between the first phase of German Ostpolitik in the 70s and the second phase uh, of the German Ostpolitik, so in the 80s. And the turning point was certainly then the emergence of the Solidarność movement in Poland. Um, because the previous Ostpolitik reached its limits for two goals of detente, strategic, strategic stability of the system and political freedom of people, like the Solidarność uh, wished, came into an internal contradiction to preserve the status quo at the same time and allowing them to be undermined. Even more, Solidarność was allegedly considered as a threat, threat to peace. This assessment expressed was by Willy Brandt, Helmut Schmidt, Egon Barr, well, then the, the main figures of the social democracy or even chancellors. But there were also social democrats who thought differently but they were not politically influential, as the mentioned once. They were, these were, for example, the political scientist Gesine Schwan, the historian Heinrich August Winkler, the politician Hans Koschnig, and also the political scientist Karl Kaiser. They were practically, as well as journalistically, committed to East European dissidents, but their commitment remained in a minority among social democrats. <clears throat> the Christian Democrats <clears throat> under Helmut Kohl, who came in power in, in 1983 as a chancellor, essentially continued the Ostpolitik, also avoiding contacts with East European opposition oppositionists for a long time. The peaceful revolution then in autumn 1989 in East Central Europe, but also in the GDR, um, were welcomed in a federal republic and also worldwide uh, as a harbinger of a new era. And the contribution of German Ostpolitik to this development was readily and somehow underly emphasized in Germany because of these contradictions which I already mentioned. Um, the Federal Republic and the GDR benefited greatly from these upheavals and from this um, peaceful revolution because of the German <coughs> reunification. But in fact, uh, the strikers in Poland in 1980 and the following years, and also to some extent the street demonstrators in the GDR in autumn 1989 had much greater influence on this development than the official German policy or the Ostpolitik. Um, in whose horizon the expectation of German reunification did not lie. So there was not foreseen in Bonn or other, almost other, any other capital that a re, re, German reunification might happen. And they were just 
few visionaries, and some of them uh, actually were among these opposition uh, protagonists, in particular in Poland. The prevailing German foreign policy paradigm in the 1990s, so after um, falling down the communism, assumed that the armed confrontation uh, were explained by misunderstanding and lack of communication. Now, political dialogue, cultural exchange, economic cooperation, instead of military alliance and defense efforts were considered as essential and sustainable for national security and peace. The war in Yugoslavia and the military deployed the rule. With the collapse of the Soviet bloc and the beginning of an EU and NATO enlargement in the Nazis for over 30 years. So there was no seen any necessity, uh, well, any national defense. <clears throat> the favorable geographical position of the reunited Germany and the real reliability of their allies strengthened the foreign policy outlined in the continuation of Ostpolitik, also in the era of Helmut Kohl. In, after 1990 or 1991, um, the concept of German Ostpolitik was somehow developed under the banner of reapproachment through integration that was driven mainly by um, <clears throat> economic cooperation. And it was based on the assumption of a convergence of interests with Russia. It was said that Moscow also wanted to modernize its economy and society. And this was expressed uh, in particular in a cooperation of the energy sector despite the warning voices from the Baltic states and from Poland. And a particular figure, well, I have to mention it here, was the third chancellor from the Social Democrat, uh, Richard uh, Gerhard Schröder, cultivated such personal close relationship with a new Russian president, Vladimir Putin. There were no room left for criticism of Russia's democratic or constitutional deficits. The Nord Stream pipeline project, which Schroeder agreed on with the Russian president shortly before he's, he's, he was leaving his chancellery in 2005, was a political disastrous and morally reprehensible, not only in the view of Gerhard Schroeder's personal interests. German policy um, changed only partial and marginal um, in 2014 with the annexation of Crimea and the war in eastern Ukraine, assuming that Russia continued to follow um, a comparable logic of foreign policy um, and but the, the Germans' policy came then in a dilemma. Uh, once they wanted to continue a cooperation, on the other hand, they had to react somehow on the annexation of Crimea. So it, in a kind of modest confrontation, uh, for example, with the sanctions, with the economic sanctions. But nevertheless, uh, this contributed to the misconception in early 2000. 22, that the Russian troop built up were merely a negotiation tactic, but not a real threat. Uh, Angela Merkel's government, as well as many other West European governments, still considered themselves uh, in the line of a long-lasting peace per period after 1989. A new major territorial or conquest war on European soil was considered uh, by the majority of observers 
as impossible. So then the shock on 24th February, the day of Russian invasion, and the whole Ukraine uh, was tremendously. Uh, the challenges facing the German government was unprecedented. Uh, Olaf Scholz's government launched into a potential long-lasting war that radically undermined two foundations of the German Federal Republic. We are witnessing the definite end of post-war period and the transition of an area of war that was still unforeseeable. Or put it in another way, on 24th February, we really woke up in another world, quote the Foreign Minister Annalena Baerbock. In terms of domestic policy, it's a matter of establishing the Republic's ability to defend themselves in terms of foreign policy is a balancing act. On the one hand, it is obliged to support Ukraine with weapons in recognition the right of self-defense. Self -defense. On the other hand, it must do everything to prevent itself as a NATO state from getting into a war against Russia, if only because it is obliged by oath to prevent harm from German people. Nevertheless, the actual political social task continues. In view on Putin's expansionism, <clears throat> what is needed, a fundamental debate about the social readiness to defend democracy in recent years, but also the challenges for democracy has grown massively in Germany. This is Particular. Okay. <laughs> this is particularly true if you look then to the far left and far right parties in Germany, in particular uh, the Alternative for Deutschland, Alternative for Germany, and its milieu, uh, which has traditionally a close link to the Kremlin and is probably also co financed by, by the Kremlin. Since 24th February, there has been an intense public debate in Germany about German's policy towards Russia and Ukraine, um, because Ukrainian, in fact, was just discovered by many Germans, discovered politically, culturally, and geographically. The debate goes across all parties, the churches, many institutions, dealing with Eastern Europe or not dealing with Eastern Europe, and last but not least, the citizens themselves. In the process, come even to take some legal actions on the court. For example, um, the very Russophile journalist, she was a correspondent in Moscow in the late 80s and beginning of 90s, Gabriele krone schmalz and the East European historian uh, pronounced Kremlin critic Franziska Davis. So it really came to a court issue and it's still there um, because of their quarrel about um, statements about Russia. On 19th October 2022, the SPD party leader Lars Klingbeil outlined uh, an official announcement of the previous German Ostpolitik and combined with the admission that the German policy, in particular the German Social Democrats, had made serious mistake uh, in their Ostpolitik. I don't want to go into the detail because of the lack of time. Uh, representatives of the Social the Christian Democrats, so the CDU and the Bavarian branch at CSU, find you, you can't find such an admission of false, although the CDU led the government for more than 16 years, oh, Angela Merkel. The same applies to the German industry, which relied heavily on cheap Russian gas and closed its eyes to the political consequences over years or even decades. Um, even within the left party, 
and very yeah, very partly in the in the AfD, there are also a controversial discussion about Russia. But now I want to come to an end. Um, the governing parties and the CDU are concerned right now with supporting the Ukraine in its daily struggle against Russian brutal war and try to strengthen Ukraine's position. Um, for today's Russia do not de defend any status quo as they did it in the 1970s, but they do radically uh, are now a re revisionist power who wants to restore the sphere of influence of the former Soviet Union. This result in a confrontation course towards the West, towards the West in which the, the Western countries cannot react with compliance, but only with determination. In this time, to spell out a fundamental new German policy towards Russia and Ukrainian, it's time, well, for a true new German Ostpolitik, but this is still ahead. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, thank you very much. So the next speaker will be Gabor Dani from Budapest, but uh, currently working for European Network Remembrance and Solidarity since several years. You've been working there. That's why we know each other, and that's why he was victim another victim I forced to come to Prague and to tell us something. Um, Gabor studied not history, if I'm not wrong, but comparative literature, and his main, his main topic of his research is cultural resistance during the communist regime, but not only in Hungary, perhaps also in Poland and, and so on. Today he will speak about, uh, uh, about the relation between uh, uh, Soviet invasion of Hungary 56 and, and Russia's war in Ukraine. Please. Yeah, thank you very much for this very kind introduction. To be honest, I don't feel to be a victim of uh, yours, more like a hero, to come here and uh, speak about uh, a subject which is not entirely uh, matches with, uh, with my area of study. <clears throat> so in my presentation, I would like to speak um, about uh, memory patterns of my home country, which has been uh, I believe uh, mentioned only in uh, the previous session um, in the presentation of Reka Sarkozy, but from an uh, entirely other uh, perspective. <clears throat> uh, so, 66 years ago, on the 4th of November 1956, the Soviet army crushed the Hungarian Revolution that had overthrown the Stalinist dictatorship and restored the pro-Soviet communist regime in Hungary. Nine months ago, on uh, 24 of February this year, uh, the Russian army invaded Ukraine with the intention of replacing the legitimately el elected Ukrainian government with a pro-Russian puppet, go puppet government and keeping Ukraine entirely under Russian influence. So the parallels are striking, especially when framed in terms of Russian imperialism. From this point of view, Hungary in 1956 and Ukraine this year were also victims of Russian imperialism. Um, but parallels can also be drawn between the armed resistance of, the, of both countries uh, to the colonialist power and also the reliance of both countries on the uh, West for help. Uh, in addition, as a historian, um, I would point out that there are at least as many differences as there are similarities between 1956 and 2022. But the parallels have a strong symbolic potential, uh, one that has been so far purposefully omitted. So bearing this historical parallels in mind, it seems that the direction of current Hungarian politics is far from being in line with the history and memory of the 1956 Hungarian Revolution. Or to put it in other words, it seems that the direction of uh, current Hungarian politics is underpinned by attempts to shape the memory of 1956 Hungarian Revolution and instrumentalize its anti-colonial revolutionary uh, symbolic potential. So in my presentation, uh, I will examine the memory of 1956 revolution from a long-term perspective, 
showing its different uh, facets, uh, explaining what has prevented it from becoming a symbol potent to build a solidarity with Ukraine. It's uh, worth saying that uh, commemorating 1956 uh, played an important role in kicking off um, uh, the history of Fidesz party and also uh, the political career of the Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban. The reburial of Imre Nagy, uh, the communist uh, Prime Minister, executed in 1958, and his fellow martyrs in Budapest Hero Square in June 1989, was a symbolic event of the regime change. The event which marked the fall of the communist dictatorship was attended by hundreds of thousands of uh, people. Viktor Orban, a member of the Alliance of Young Democrats, so the Fidesz party, said in a speech that was undoubtedly courageous uh, the following words, I quote, if we do not lose sight of the ideas of 1956, we can elect a government that will immediately begin negotiations for the immediate withdrawal of Russian troops. This claim is quite far from what Viktor Orban stands for uh, 33 years later. This year, on the anniversary of the 1956 revolution, the Hungarian Prime Minister made an euphemistic post on Twitter in which he did not name who defeated the Hungarian revolution in 1956. This incident was immediately reacted uh, to in a meme by, uh, me meme by um, Ukrainian media and with other uh, critical comments. And it, uh, also, uh, it is also significant that uh, the Fidesz party did not organize a central commemoration this year. And between these two uh, endpoints, uh, 1989 and uh, 2022, Orban made several speeches on the anniversaries of the 1956 revolution. And in these speeches, the memory of 1956 has always been reinterpreted according to the political goals of the day. <clears throat> in um, 2007, uh, from an opposition position, also criticizing the uh, policies of the then socialist government, he said, uh, I quote, we can really see that in 1956 we made a revolution against the East. So he just, uh, just opposed uh, Hungary against the East, uh, not so much as a specific country, but as a cultural and social dominion. So let's say the other. Uh, for 2016, the meaning of the 1956 revolution has been slightly uh, modified. Um, in his in this speech, he emphasized the anti-imperial, anti-colonial dimension of the revolution, while linking imperialism uh, not with uh, Soviet policy but with EU policies. <clears throat> By 2022, the meaning of revolution has changed again. Uh, I quote him: "If we look at it, in 1956, we did not fight because we thought we were going to defeat the Soviet Union. We undertook a revolution and the fight for freedom in order to force a ceasefire." and the peace nego negotiation. He highlighted fight for freedom, uh, presenting it as a way to force peace while downplaying the anti-Soviet character of the revolution. So this is the current narrative, according to which the Hungarian rebels of 1956 actually fought uh, to force the peace negotiations. And this narrative introduces a new mnemonic trope, uh, this time without any historical basis. <clears throat> This narrative is now being used to justify why Hungary is not supporting Ukraine with arms and why it is following a separate policy in the EU. In, in the EU. It is not hard to argue that the last and a half decade uh, has seen various and varied examples of instrumentalization of the memory of 1956. But the question is, what makes the memory of 1956 so susceptible to instrumentalization and even distortion. Uh, in my presentation, I will offer a uh, few arguments. So the first argument is that uh, 1956 was a complex and multidimensional historical event uh, with many possible meanings. Just one example, among the key actors of 1956, we can identify uh, the various faces of the resistance. We have, for example, uh, university students, um, as you see, intellectuals, writers, 
who organize public discussions and also provided a critical discourse about what has been happening in Hungary during Stalinism. So we have this discursive resistance, let's, let's say. Uh, we have also workers uh, who try to organize their own representation by as establishing workers' councils, a kind of uh, precursor of the police solidarity movement. Um, we have also street fighters who fought with weapons against uh, the Soviet occupiers. So we have this kind of representatives of uh, armed resistance. And it is also worth mentioning that the Hungarian Revolution began with demonstrations in solidarity with Poles, with the Poles, and then the Poles also expressed their solidarity with the Hungarians, for example, by donating medicine and uh, blood. Uh, by the way, one of the most um, sympathetic commemorations for me uh, was the opportunity to uh, donate blood at the Polish Institute in Budapest a few years ago on the anniversary of the uh, revolution. And uh, this form of um, commemoration reiterated an important gesture of the revolution, added, it, uh, added to it the value of uh, solidarity, and um, provided real help for those uh, in need. Uh, the politics of memory in Hungary, as led by um, uh, the director of um, House of Terror, Maria Schmidt, among others, um, has at the same time totalized the street fighter among the faces of the revolution, uh, as was clearly seen in uh, 2016 on the 60th uh, anniversary of the revolution. On the one hand, uh, this simplified the image of the revolution, making it, making it one-dimensional, and on the other hand, uh, made its meaning uh, more and more abstract. Uh, so this is something something similar uh, which Alexei um, spoke about, uh, like the empty figure of uh, of, of, of the fa fascist. Uh, this the, this trope is something similar to it. Um, it means it also downplayed the memory of the social solidarity and of resistance or mobilization different uh, than the one based on physical fight. Uh, so this abstract figure of the street fighter removed from his historical context, has become the important one, who with a kind of rhetorical gesture can fight anyone, uh, that's why it's empty, uh, be it the oppressor from the East or Brussels, be it an armed force or an international law or a, a, a sanction imposed by uh, Brussels. Um, the next argument is about the silenced uh, revolution. Uh, after the Soviets finally crushed the uprising and appointed a puppet government headed by Janos Kadar, the Kadar government restored communist rule in Hungary and remained, for power for, re remained in power for three decades. After 1956, as you uh, probably know, the Kadar regime began a harsh repression. Hundreds of people were executed. Uh, tens of thousands were sentenced uh, to prison or um, interned. According to the official ideology of the communist Kadar regime, what happened in 1956 was a counter-revolution organized by imperialist powers uh, to restore the capitalist feudal system which existed between the two world wars. And the narrative of counter-revolution counter was uh, given full currency in Hungary, uh, marked by this brutal repression. Uh, it was a constantly reaffirmed state propaganda narrative to which several newspaper articles, TV and radio programs were devoted, especially in, on the anniversaries. The Kadaris propaganda completely silenced the truth about uh, 1956. The true memory of uh, the revolution could survive only thanks to actors and institutions operating uh, in, any, in um, emigration, such as Radio Free Europe. In Hungary, behind the Iron Curtain, the memory of the revolution was revived in the 1980s, thanks to opposition and human rights groups. Um, so that means that for 30 years, the revolution existed as a silent, repressed, forbidden memory for a large part of the society, while the Kada regime constantly reminded uh, the Hungarian society of the repression and is insisted that the revolution was in fact a counter-revolution. So this enforced silence uh, was a major obstacle for, uh, for the, uh, to the uh, 1956 revolution becoming an established yet multifaceted uh, social memory constructed via open public uh, discourse. Uh, that was my second argument. Um, and the third one, uh, as I have already mentioned, the memory of uh, 1956 re-emerged in the 1980s with a culmination in 1989 during the period of regime change and democratic transformation, 
with a powerful impact. The former participants of the revolution uh, became active participants in the democratic changes. Just to give you an example, the writer Arpad Gönc, imprisoned for six years after the revolution, became president of the Republic of Hungary. So it was this uh, generation, many of whom became involved in the human rights fights and struggles in the 1980s, and in the act activities of the uh, Hungarian democratic opposition, rehabilitating the memory of the revolution. In the 1980s, uh, several Samizdat publications uh, were published relating to the 1956 revolution. Commemorations were held in the private houses or unofficial um, exhibitions were organized. More than 60 years after the revolution, however, this generation of the former eyewitnesses and participants has passed away. The authority has disappeared behind the memories. A void has been left, a void further facilitating the appropriation, reconfiguration and simplification of mnemonic narratives around the Hungarian uh, Revolution, their shape and symbolic meaning, including the one conducted as part of the official central uh, commemorations. <clears throat> the disappearance of former uh, witnesses marks another important fault line, the transition from communicative memory to cultural memory. This reinforces the role of uh, the institutions, also education that maintain cultural memory, but also films or uh, pop culture. And in this situation, it's crucial that uh, the previously institutionalized forms of 1956 have been um, pushed into the background. After um, uh, 2010, there has been a systematic dismantling of the memory sites and institutions that maintained the cultural meaning of 1956. The 1956 Institute, uh, whose members had been contacting oral history interviews with former uh, revolutionaries since the 1980s, was merged into the National Seicheny Library and stripped off its independent institutional framework. Or another example, is that the statue of Imre Nagy was removed from its original site. So that was a, a, a statue which uh, stood on a bridge uh, near to the Hungarian parliament. And it, 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 it also had a kind of symbolical meaning since it ex expressed the personal fate of the uh, former prime minister as he became from a communist politician to a national martyr. Uh, but also it symbolized the transition uh, from a People's Republic, Republic to a Republic and a democratic country in 1989. And this iconic uh, uh, statue in the surroundings of the parliament uh, was uh, placed to another square uh, a few years ago. At the same time, the historical narratives are also changing, as, what said, as it was said at the beginning of my presentation. Um, Imre Nagy is no longer a central figure of the events. The role of the former um, democratic opposition, which had uh, done so much to revive the memory of 1956 and which had taken existential risks in the 1980s, is marginalized. And at the same time, uh, Orban's activities and his speech in 1989, which was uh, at the beginning of my presentation, uh, are of great importance um, now. It is worth mentioning that in uh, 2000. Uh, 16 on the 60th anniversaries of the revolution, um, an exhibition on the history of the revolution was organized in the Na Hungarian National Museum, a narrative of which ended with Orban's 1989 speech. Three years later, on the 30th anniversaries of the uh, change of regime, this speech was again in the spotlight. So uh, this way, this funding myth of uh, the Fidesz party goes back to 1956 through 1989. Uh, and this narrative portrays uh, the Fidesz as a fundamental political force in 1989, uh, which in 1989, uh, to be honest, was only a tiny uh, party in the, t in, in the time of regime change, although it now has a constitutional majority in the Hungarian parliament. And also these arguments can be completed with, an, with another one, uh, that the weak and fragmented opposition in Hungary uh, has for years failed to uh, make any powerful or meaningful proposals uh, on what to do with the memory of 1956 or what it should be remembered 
for. So my conclusion overall, uh, that it can be said that the memory of 1956 is not fixed as a transgenerational uh, social memory. Uh, there is no social and cultural framework uh, that would clearly show the meaning as the, and the historical significance of the revolution and thus prevent the relativizing and uh, distorting practices of 1956. And the current politics of memory exploits um, this, this void, uh, void uh, cruelly, unifying and standardizing the memory uh, of the 1956 revolution. Uh, and the authentic and multidimensional memory of 1956 needs to be rediscovered uh, and uh, to be the basis for social meanings such as uh, transnational solidarity, which is uh, once again much needed today, uh, given the war in Ukraine. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. So the, our next speaker and next 15 minutes belongs to Martin Pekar. Martin Pekar is a professor of history at the Pavel Josef Shafarik University in Košice. He served, or maybe still serves, as a vice rector of the university. His main domain is history of Slovakia, history of minorities, history of Holocaust, but also history of urbanism. He belonged to the organizers and leaders of huge Europe Horizon 20 founded project about history of urbanism in, in Europe. Uh, today he will speak about, uh, just to have a precise title of your presentation, he will speak about misunderstanding versus disinformation, historical events, and the performance of public policy in Slovakia. But important thing to mention is that he is a co-author of the paper, Sylvia Ruchinska, who was another co-author for a reason that she is ill, cannot, cannot join us, but maybe you can say a few words about her. Mm -hmm. Yeah, please. Okay, thank you very much uh, for the invitation and also for the uh, introduction. Yes, uh, Sylvia Ruchinska uh, became ill, so she was not able to, to come with me. Uh, she's my colleague from uh, university, uh, from the Faculty of Public Administration, and uh, she, uh, her research is oriented uh, on, uh, on governance and, uh, and practical issues uh, uh, connected with, uh, with public policy. So uh, she, she also has a quite a huge project on fake news and, uh, and uh, disinformation, and that was the uh, reason why we put us together, because uh, she serves also as vice rector at our university, so it's my colleague uh, in, in, uh, in this sense. And we put together our, our ideas, let's say. So I, I, uh, I will present uh, our uh, our uh, presentation, and uh, I prefer to read it because it's. Uh, I am not able to repeat her parts uh, free, so I will prefer to 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 read. So, uh, as the conference call says, interpretations of history, as long uh, demonstrated by contemporary Russian leaders, in their effort to justify the war against Ukraine, is strongly reminiscent of the argumentation used by Hitler, Ribbentrop, or Molotov against Czechoslovakia and Poland in 1938 and 39. We perceive this, let's call it instrumentalization of history, as uh, one, me, a historian working on the history of the 20th century, not as an expert on Russian-Ukrainian relations, and uh, second, Sylvia, as a political scientist working on the impact of this uh, disinformation on the public policy performance. It is precisely because of this perspective, combining historical knowledge with today's experience and the optics of the border region, uh, that the organizers of the conference invited us to comment on historical references towards the ongoing military conflict in Ukraine in the current political discourse and on some related implication for public policy performance in Slovakia in qualified manner, but not based on a specific research. Thinking about uh, one of the main questions of the conference, to what extent the historical memory affects current politics, can actually lead us to a simple answer if we take inspiration, for example, from Maurice Halbach's 
Historical memory is the reconstruction of selected specific components of the past. Its significance lies in the fact that it provides moral, political, or other lessons from the past, and as such, it also has an ed educational message and predictive potential. As is well known, therefore, historical memory cannot be separated from current social frameworks. It corresponds to the ideas and needs of the present. Just as the expectations of the present are cha changing, historical memory is continuously being renewed and reassessment of history is being called for. One of the several components of historical memory, according to Jan and Aleida Asman, is political memory, uh, which, as its name says, is directly connected with politics, more precisely with the ruling power constellation and institutions. Political memory is closely linked to the specific political goals of one cohesive group. Its media are, among other things, mobilizing political narratives about the past. For the completeness, it should be added that historical memory is a part of the historical consciousness of the society, together with the individual lived experience, ideological interpretation of the history and scientific historical knowledge. You see that some structure on, the, on your left hand side, uh, what I'm talking about, it's structure of the, of the uh, hist historical consciousness as such. Yeah. And uh, four, four uh, components, and uh, you see the component historical memory has uh, internal stru structure again. And, and I, I pointed it out because I'm talking about these categories. There is no doubt uh, that the level of quality of the historical consciousness of a society depends on the quality of individual components and on the level of complementarity among these components. The purpose of this simplified theoretical consideration is to underline the fact that the interaction among history, memory, and politics is neither simple or one, uh, or, uh, nor one directional in any form, and that any public handling of history must be responsible as it can bring extremely complex social impacts. The case where history is rewritten by a historian in such a way as to deny reality and relativize events and role of persons is most often known as historical misrepresentation or distortion of history. In our presentation, however, we do not deal with historians but with politicians. The actualization and instrumentalization of history are common tools for politicians no matter how good their knowledge of history is. Although the public statements of politicians often bear the, the features of historical misrepresentation, we have chosen the, to use uh, the more neutral uh, term misunderstanding in the context. This term also contains an aspect of lack of intention to rewrite history, although this is what ultimately happens in the historical consciousness of society, as we have tried to explain briefly in the short theoretical part of the presentation. The, uh, in recent years, the term disinformation has been increasingly used in connection with the circulation of incorrect and uh, misleading information in the public domain. It is an interdisciplinary and cross-cutting phenomenon and topic which is not possible to assign to a specific discipline. The topic is dealt with uh, politicians, scientists, researchers, uh, experts, authorities such as the European Commission, Council of Europe and others. One of the relevant classifications was provided by Claire Wardell and Hossein Darakshan, who separated misinformation, disinformation, and malinformation with the fo focus on harm and falseness of the content. This is the second, uh, second picture. I hope you can, you can, you can read it. I, I cannot because I don't have my glasses now. <laughs> uh, in addition, in surveys dealing uh, with the spread uh, of conspiracy theories and disinformation, the Slovak Republic was considered as one of the countries where the problem was identified as highly acute and complex already in the period before the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic. This was pointed out, for example, by the Globsec survey, uh, the results of which were published in 2020. 
the COVID-19 pandemic and later the military conflict between Russia and Ukraine have not only uh, exacerbated the problem, but have also added a new aspect, such as comparison with historical events or phenomena, for example, Nazism, the Holocaust, and so on. In the next part of the presentation, we will pay attention to how selected Slovak politicians operated with the past when commenti commenti uh, commenting on the conflict in the first weeks after its outbreak, both from the perspective of history and the impact on practical politics. We follow the statements of the President Zuzana Čaputova, Prime Minister Eduard Heger, members of the government Matovic, Nať, Korčok, Remišova, members of the European Parliament, Uhrik, Juriš uh, Nikolsonova, and leading opposition politicians Fico, Kotleba, Pellegrini. Uh, in the printed media, uh, on, and on Facebook or YouTube, this, uh, they, their statements. We emphasize that uh, this is not the result of a scientific research, but a qualified commentary on a limited sample of sources. Looking at the reactions of politicians in the first week of the conflict, references to history were very popular. This is evidenced not only by their uh, frequency, but also by their repetition in several statements by a given politician. An example is Deputy Prime Minister Remishova, who as a Security Council member in several interviews has compared Putin's methods to Hitler's. Quotation, he uses exactly the same excuses for the occupation. Sometimes it is protection of minorities as Hitler did when he broke up Czechoslovakia. Other times it is a referendum under the barrel of guns as he did in Austria. End of the quotation. She pointed out that at the time of the Munich betrayal, other states thought that uh, by sacrificing Czechoslovakia, they would secure peace. Remishova used a comparison to historical events that resonated among historians too. However, she put more emotion into, into it when she used the less frequent in Slovak environment expression Munich betrayal instead of Munich agreement. At the end of the May 2022, uh, Denik N published the full transcript of President Chaputova's speech to the Ukrainian parliament. In it, she recalled historically quite correctly and with an acceptable explanation the events of 1938 and 68. It's a quite long quotation, so I will not read it. You, you, can, you can see it. Uh, in both cases, it means 38 and 68, she wanted to inform and to stress that Slovakia understands Ukraine's feelings and will search for a solution that does not repeat the mistakes of the past. The two politicians met mentions now, it means uh, uh, Remishova and Chaputova, and their statements can be example of a responsible handling of uh, res references to history, although even with these examples, it should not be forgotten that history is being used for political goals. Attitudes towards the war conflict and, the, and its different contextualization are not only a matter of values, but also a significant different, uh, differentiating feature of the internal political struggle in Slovakia. On the other side of the political spectrum are the Smer, Social Democracy, Social Democracy, and so-called so -called, uh, right-wing extremist parties, Kotleba and Republika. Uh, although all these three political parties have co uh, condemned uh, Russia's aggression itself, they view it through a different set of values. It's obvious that their rhetoric responds to the polarization of Slovak society and is predominantly an instrument of internal political struggle. Smer uh, formulates its political positions uh, mainly through the statements of party chairman Fico, who is the main speaker at most press conferences and party events. One of them was the celebration of the Slovak national uprising, which Smer organized in 2022 in Zvolen. The uprising is one of the most important events in contemporary Slovak history, a pillar of contemporary Slovak statehood. And according to sociological research, it is also perceived as a significant in the historical consciousness of Slovak society. 
during this celebration, which was not chosen randomly, in the presence of the Russian ambassador and the representative of the Belarusian embassy, statements were made about the need to respect history identified in this case with respect for libertation from fascism. Similar mobilization and appeal based on uh, historical misunderstood references implying the relativization of Russia's responsibility and the partial responsibility of the West and uh, Ukraine for the outbreak of the military conflict were undertaken by Fico earlier in connection with the harms of the Slavin monument which mentioned Uri and showed you the pictures in, uh, in his presentation. Uh, Kotleba responded to the outbreak of the military conflict with a statement via a video published on YouTube. His position was full of conspiracies about the guilt of the EU and NATO, while he named the war in Iraq, destruction of Libya, Syria, bombing on, on of Yugoslavia, and the recognition of Kosovo as evidence without further explanation. In Kotleba's, in, in Kotleba's implied but unspoken interpretation, all the mentioned uh, historical events were proof of NATO's aggressiveness, analogous to the to that of which uh, Russia became a victim in February 2022. Essentially the same ideas, but in a much more sophisticated and dangerous form were expressed by a member of European Parliament, Uhrik, together with his advisor, Marian Durish, in an interview streamed through Facebook. Uhrik tried to encourage viewers to think critically when listening to official news. He did not have uh, an extremely negative attitude towards av uh, available information and accepted the truth of some uh, uh, clear facts, but questioned others. He tried to create uh, the impression of knowledge of the topic from the environment of European Parliament and the objectivity of his own position based on critical, his own critical considerations. By this mixing of authority, truth and fiction, by the seemingly competent and frequent use of term disinformation, he created an extremely confusing space for further manipulation supported by extensive account of uh, alleged provocations faced by Russia prior to the inv invasion. By the way, they called 20% of the available information about the war as true. Only 20%. All three of these examples, it means Fico, Kotleba, Uhrik, show signs of rhetorical manipulation. They offer a dualistic vision of the world and create an image of the enemy. For example, they use generalization. I, I, I would like to open this uh, slide because you see this, this uh, connection between this information and, uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, mis misinformation and so on, because I mentioned this, uh, I, I, you, uh, I, I talk about this, these things now. So all, all of these three examples, Kotleba, Uhrig and Fico, show signs of rhetorical manipulation. They offer a dualistic vision of the world and create an image of the enemy. For example, they use generalizations, metaphors of personal insults to create this image. Manipulation of uh, facts, deliberate editing of information appears clearly in the speeches of uh, Uhrik and Kotleba. Their statements carry clear elements of disinformation. Two brief comments, we, and I'm coming to the end. Uh, first, or first one, comment on uh, inappropriate comparison with correct content. Similar to vaccination during the pandemic, uh, comparisons of the current situation with the Holocaust often appeared in the case of uh, the war in Ukraine. In his Facebook status, Foreign Minister Korchok politically misused uh, the importance of uh, 80th anniversary of the first transport of Jews from Slovakia. And instead of the respecting the victims, he redirected uh, re redirected attention to Ukraine in the status. In these cases, the misunderstanding of history had the worst consequences uh, from the point of view of historical consciousness and politics, which, is, uh, which it still served uh, as a tool of mobilization. Second comment, on the local perspective. 
the region of uh, eastern Slovakia, where before the invasion a large Ukrainian community lived, was confronted with the consequences of the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine uh, almost immediately. Local government officials dealt, uh, dealt with the situation in an attempt to prevent a humanitarian catastrophe. Statements of local authorities were not directed to the, the, at the perception of the military conflict and its causes, but called on citizens to show solidarity and help. The specificity of the region, which uh, in the background has limited discussion about the causes and nature of the uh, conflict, is the persistent respect and gratitude to the Red Army, which at the turn on, uh, of 1944-45 uh, fought extremely difficult libertation battles on the territory of Eastern Slovakia. And uh, conclu short conclusion, two or three sentences. Uh, the name of the conference is the Memory of the Past and uh, Politics of the Present. I would say Memory of the Past works in Politics of the Present in Slovakia in connection with the military conflict in Ukraine in all directions. The impact uh, affects individuals and society and have political, economic, social and also ethical consequences which have to be uh, uh, a subject uh, of a serious research and discussion. So uh, thank you for this opportunity to discuss these questions here and thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much for your interesting paper. Among other things also, I would like to thank you that you are perhaps the only one of the speakers who didn't deny that memory of the past has a certain impact on the politics of the present, which was my original idea. Okay, so the last speaker of the conference will be David Svoboda. David Svoboda is a research fellow in the Institute for the Study of uh, Totalitarian regimes. Yesterday, someone mentioned that in Germany there is no one, there is no one expert on Ukrainian history. So I, I know at least three experts on Ukrainian history <laughs> in Prague. David Svoboda is one of them. Uh, his his research was and still is, especially about Ukrainian nationalism, Ukrainian insurgent army, and so on. Last year, he published a really thick book about radical Ukrainian nationalism in the interwar period. And today he is going to speak about uh, uh, Ukrainian political radicalism in Czech public stereotypes of the 20th and 21st century. Please. Thanks a lot for introducing me and uh, of course for inviting me. Ladies and uh, gentlemen, um, my topic is going to be a bit, um, so to say, intellectual, you know. Uh, I mean, um, I'm uh, going to talk um, about a phenomenon which I deem um, <coughs> very important in order to understand the present-day Czech prejudices, the activity of uh, pro-Russian trolls with their anti-Ukrainian message, and the success and a relative success which um, we may observe in Czech intellectual environment, uh, I would say, after uh, 2014. I mean, in my view, there's, uh, there's always been something uh, specific about uh, Czech views of Ukraine, like in a European context. Uh, <clears throat> although there was only a relatively short period when the Czechs had to deal with the Ukrainian question directly, I mean the interwar period um, of um, Czechoslovakia and uh, the existence of uh, uh, Transcarpathia or Subcarpathian uh, uh, Rus, you know, when um, uh, Prague had to um, simply um, <clears throat> Uh, coordinate or think over um, uh, this uh, Ukrainian or Russian problem there. This period lasted only two decades uh, and it definitely um, ended in 1939. And uh, still I dare to say that there have always 
always been a very uh, prevalent strong views of Ukraine of Ukraine and the Ukrainian question which without a precise knowledge of Ukrainian realities economic culture and so on penetrated Czech minds uh, mostly in form of some um, um, radical phenomenons on the Ukrainian part I mean, the Czechs have always been like attracted by some signs of Ukrainian, um, uh, let's say, um, okay, radicalism, uh, violence, that it was like the violent traits of Ukrainian history, violent deeds and violent processes, uh, which um, had a profound impact and found a uh, profound echo um, in Czech minds. This might seem maybe paradoxical and um, I don't mean to demonize um, uh, no way the Ukrainians and I don't want to make the Czechs stupid but I just want um, let me uh, say some example in uh, some chronology what I mean by this definition for example there was also a positive side of this attraction to Ukrainian violence. It was the uh, romantic enchantment um, uh, of the Cossack myths. In the 19th century, there was um, a small number of uh, Czech um, literary figures who found inspiration in the Cossack myths. For example, Otokar Březina, Josef Václav Fritsch, who as soon as in uh, 1868 uh, issued a pamphlet calling for a free Ukraine, so he was quite progressive in, in this sense, and he also belauded um, the, the famous personality of Cossack um, Hetman um, Ivan Mazepa, Edvard Jelinek and uh, the others. But there was um, sure a um, uh, negative um, aspect of um, of this, um, of this, um, uh, let's say, tendency, and that was like a um, um, tradition of. Uh, suspecting the Ukrainians uh, or the protagoni protagonists of the Ukrainian national movement of being like German spies, being like German tool in order to undermine Slavic unity uh, with Russia in the first place. So in the view of Czech conservatists and Czech nationalists, there was um, um, like um, there, could, there could be no talk about an Ukrainian nationality, separate Ukrainian nationality. They all uh, viewed this as a uh, German intrigue inspired um, uh, by Berlin or Vienna. But on the progressive part of Czech society, um, uh, there uh, was also um, uh, much sympathy um, <clears throat> regarding the um, Ukrainian or at least Western Ukrainian movement within the framework of Habsburg monarchy because the Czechs shared a common fate with the um, Rusins of how the Ukrainians or Western Ukrainians were uh, usually being called those times uh, routines yeah, the, the, the word Ukrainians uh, was not much frequented until let's say the first year of the 20th century and um, nowadays it might sound quite paradoxical and it shows the changes um, the Czech uh, mind has undergone, uh, undergone in the course of the last uh, century because in uh, <clears throat> let's say 1908 um, the Czechs viewed or um, the progressive part of um, Czech, um, Czech um, um, politics viewed the Ukrainians and Western Ukrainians as um, our uh, like um, uh, brothers so to say brothers um, of destiny they viewed um, the Ukrainian movement as very akin to the Czechs in terms of the, 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 um, the Ukrainians are like a plebeian folk which is very um, similar um, to the Czechs in terms of democracy because some thinkers deemed the Ukrainians more democratic uh, because of their closeness to the Czechs than um, um, the Poles who were the masters of Ukrainian provinces in former Austria, uh, Austria Hungary. And uh, if I mentioned a concrete year, 1908, um, I uh, did so because 
It was a year when uh, there happened a very tragic and dramatic event in uh, Galicia, in Lviv, when a young socialist radical student, Miroslav Sicinski, killed a governor of uh, Galicia, um, um, Count um, Andrzej Pototsky, which was quite a scandal because it was the first high profile political assassination of those times um, in, um, in Austria Hungary. And this made uh, <clears throat> the future Czechoslovak president, Tomáš Garik Masaryk, uh, <clears throat> uh, say a parliamentary or uh, make a parliamentary speech, a, le uh, a lecture. Um, on this topic, uh, where Masaryk showed his views of the Ukrainian question, he made some remarkable, remarkable um, 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 remarks or note for noteworthy remarks. Um, he said he repeated that we the Czechs are more democratic, definitely than the Germans and then the Poles, and that the Ukrainians and that the young Ukrainian movement is um, also strong struggling to um, um, to um, um, uh, express its own will, um, despite the Polish aristocratic um, aspirations. He said directly, we the Czechs are more similar to the Ukrainians than we are to the Poles, because the Poles are aristocrats. And um, he also um, uh, added that, um, he, that he hoped that there was no terrorist network, organized terror terrorist network in Galicia, and he hoped that um, the was acting on his own um, 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 because <clears throat> He said, in case of um, um, being a terrorist network uh, there, uh, that could be a much bigger problem, but uh, <clears throat> at least it would be more controllable. If people, young Ukrainians, are acting on their own, um, uh, that um, could um, uh, cause some problems like with identifying them and, and um, um, like um, 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 handling all, all this situation. Um, there was like in uh, 19 and 10 um, a coverage um, written for a Czech liberal journal, CHAS. Uh, Masaryk also worked for, uh, for this journal. And uh, Masaryk's future um, cooperator, Bohdan Pavlu, made some very sympathetic remarks uh, regarding the young Ukrainians because he traveled across Galicia. And um, he said that he saw young Ukrainians very militant, like um, uh, working in the tradition of the former Haida Makas, so um, uh, Ukrainian insurgents in 18th century. And um, he also made a malevolent um, uh, notion um, when he said that one needs a sharp X for um, a uh, hard wood. So uh, uh, what he meant by this, if the Poles are behaving in, su were behaving in such a way, if the, um, the Poles um, um, hold um, uh, um, the, the Ukrainians um, in uh, low esteem, then it was no wonder that the Ukrainians um, responded in kind, and then that they admired the assassinator, the young Sichinsky, who at those times, uh, 1910, was dwelling in a prison in Stanislav before he escaped to the United States. And um, that was a very colorful personality. OK, in the interwar period, it also might, uh, might sound parad um, paradoxical. But um, uh, the Czech lands um, became a safe haven for many Ukrainian immigrants from uh, Poland, who were like students who um, uh, were looking for better um, studying perspectives. Um, and um, really, it's no exaggeration when I say that um, uh, uh, Prague and other Czech um, towns uh, became a cradle of uh, young um, radical Ukrainian nation nationalism. The famous journal, Kland uh, clandestine journal, Rozbudova Nazi, was um, um, issued and published um, in the Czech lands and then uh, smuggled into Poland. And um, uh, Prague uh, silently tolerated the activity of Ukrainian radicals, uh, although the police circles um, 
often were worried and wrote reports uh, where they warned against the organization of uh, Colonel Konovalets because there was no other name in the Czech police terminology for activities which we now know under the name um, um, or the organization of Ukrainian nationalists and Ukrainian military organization and, and so on. So these, uh, these things were like quite unknown to um, um, uh, the Czechoslovak uh, police of those times, but still they viewed this tendency with certain sympathies uh, when it came to Poland because uh, the, um, the relations with Poland were very tense at those times. This all changed after a certain rapprochement in the 1934 uh, after the assassination of Polish Minister, uh, Minister of Interior uh, Bronislaw Pieracki when these Ukrainian radicals were expulsed. But now it might sound paradoxical because the Czech um, public uh, space and uh, Czech networks uh, have been full of um, very critical remarks uh, and propaganda against the so-called Banderites, you know, Banderites and, and radical Ukrainian nationalism. But the, che the Czechs tend to forget that it was them who tolerated this movement, uh, these tendencies, um, like um, 80, 80 or 90 years ago. And uh, what was the start? Part of this um, the topic of this uh, anti banderite propaganda. Uh, it was, I would say, the first post war years, because to put it short, and we are running out of time, oh, sure, I'm, I'm aware of it, but to put it short, um, uh, this uh, like psychosis uh, which put and brought the, this, an, uh, this ba bandery, um, um, banderovci topic, you know, which um, since that time has been uh, still vivid uh, up until today. In Czech minds and discourse. You know, uh, these were like, uh, this was like the work of the post war communist. Um um, uh, intelligence and, and police structures and apparatus. But now it might sound paradoxical, but uh, the, 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 um, the Ukrainian insurgents were first not viewed as a um, clear Ukrainian movement, but it was uh, rather treated in ideological terms, Marxist-Leninist terms, even before the February um, um, 48 uh, communist coup d'etat. And they were like dep depicted as a uh, Sort of renegades, strange people, and, and a mixture, what is most important, of not only Ukrainians, but also reaction, reactionary Poles, former German Nazis, and so on. There was no like clear definition of this phenomenon as a Ukrainian one. Yeah. There was also no mention of like Wolinian massacres, uh, which is like a topic of um, Czech public debate, which is uh, really uh, horribly, I, um, you know, I um, uh, don't mean like to. Um, uh, to negate or um, uh, to um, um, to um, um, uh, um, uh, 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 deny, you know, uh, uh, these things being true. But uh, the firm and the exaggerated firm shows a clear anti-Ukrainian tendency, which is utilized by uh, pro-Russian social networks, pro-Russian tro uh, so-called trolls, and so on. And it's really interesting that this, this anti-Banderite um, topic is still vivid and um, uh, still like a um, topical uh, today, um, uh, considering that, uh, unlike, for example, Slovakia, or um, um, not to say Poland, yeah? the Czechs had no direct like uh, con uh, context or traumas, historical traumas. The uh, penetration of some units of the Ukrainian insurgent army in the post-war years, um, um, 1945, 46, 47, okay, but this was just a like uh, security um, matter, but uh, they had uh, nothing to do with some geopolitical critical results, critical problems. Plans, you know, these people, these, uh, these um, members of um, the Ukrainian insurgent army, like, um, uh, made, um, uh, spread it uh, anti Soviet propaganda, warned against. Um, um, uh, spreading of Soviet influence in uh, Central Europe, but still, when it comes to direct uh, victims, uh, when it comes to um, like uh, uh, losses in in life and um, like the human toll, uh, th these were really individual individual units. Much more people uh, perished uh, during this ideologically fomented uh, fight against the uh, Banderivci in Eastern Slovakia. I mean, um, uh, the young soldiers, uh, ill-prepared young soldiers, and so on. But 
but still since that time this topic like hold and has been um, uh, um, um, has been holding firm in Czech minds it inspired a number of artistic works like films uh, you know like uh, the shadows of um, a hot summer um, from František Vláčil, famous Czech director, Pasáček's Doliny, you know, um, like, um, uh, no, there's no time to translate it, and so on, and some books, and, and so on. One cannot say that this was definitely, yeah, de that was uh, a product of communist propaganda, but the topic, uh, as I have said, uh, is still um, very, very, um, um, uh, um, like, um, Actual, or it, it attracts um, uh, much attention up until now. Uh, what was the? And um, I, I'm, I'm going to end by this because um, I, um, I, I know that um, maybe I'm too long. But uh, what was? Um, I call it a revolution um, when it comes to the trend. Um, I'm talking about when it comes to like a uh, Czech perception of Ukrainians um, through the eyes of, of uh, political radicalism. No, uh, definitely I would say it was uh, the year uh, 2014, but not only in the Czech lands. And there's no doubt that um, the Russian propaganda spreading this, uh, like waging this um, war of uh, memories, war of history, weaponizing history, that um, it doesn't concern uh, only the Czech lands. But in the Czech lands, in Czech mentality, this um, um, production finds a fertile soil, so to say. There are some very global topics like Azov, which is part of the name of my of my contribution. Okay, Battalion Azov, there's also, there's always been much um, uh, like um, um, uh, many worries about Ukrainian neo-Nazis and so on. But this is not a specifically Czech topic and it's not not a topic specifically targeted at Czech public, but um, in the um in this sense, there's also a national legacy, so to say, when all these topics like um, Azov and so, so on, which are global, find also uh, some resonance or echo uh, in a uh, very specific Czech way, which is the fight against the, um, the Bender rights after the war, which is also a very special figure, which we, 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 can, um, we can find um, very, very often, um, even in uh, like, um, um, you know, by authors who belong to a liberal um, part of the um, of uh, of, um, um, of of Czech public life, but they, they also um, uh, are using like a um, very uh, simplistic sentence that the Bender rights in Volinia in the Second World War um, massacred not only the Poles and Jews, but also the Volinian Czechs. And this is a very specific, very, um, so to say, um, I, I would say targeted topic. Um, unfortunately, I don't know its author. We don't know who the authors of this uh, pseudo-historical or exaggerated, twisted historical legacies were. But um, they could deserve a Nobel Prize, so to say, when it comes to um, uh, the effect of their, of their twisted and manipulating message. Because um, as is uh, obvious, it works. So thank you for your attention. I just wanted to draw attention to the fact that um, the Czechs should pay more attention to the tendencies and shifts in their perception of Ukrainian radicalism, because as has been noted, they, um, there was also a sympathetic stance toward Ukrainian radicalism. There was also a, um, a hint at a similarity of the Ukrainian radicals and Czech heritage, plebeian, democratic, you know, anti-aristocratic heritage. And um, okay, the Interwar Czechoslovak Republic also some support um, uh, for uh, for um, for Ukrainian radicals from um, uh, Poland, and that all changed after the Second World uh, War. So there was a um, sharp 
um, um, sharp turn, turn of Czech um, sympathies, of Czech perceptions, and this um, like rift is clearly visible even today, since those times we um, uh, we we are more liable to fall victims of uh, uh, Russia's spread um, pseudo uh, historical um, agenda. So thank you very much, and I'm sorry for maybe being too too long. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was not that long. You were able almost to do it within the time limit, and even you added the uh, 19th century. So. That's uh, okay. So, uh, okay. So, we still. I, I hope we still have some time for a short discussion. And I see. I see the questions. Uh, Michal Borovic and Bradley Reynolds. So and Valeria Korablyova. So three questions from the audience. Uh, thank you very much for 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 your. Uh, talks. Uh, I have only only one comment uh, to, to this. Uh, I would like to say that in uh, our discussions about the events that, that are in focus of our interest now here at this conference, uh, wording is is, is especially uh, important. And uh, what we uh, deal with isn't uh, war in Ukraine or Ukrainian war. It isn't even. Kind of, no, no, not not the conflict among Ukraine and Russia. It is uh, Russian war against Ukraine or Russian invasion in Ukraine. Otherwise, it would be misinformation or misinformation. Even, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Hi. So this is a question for uh, Berkard and then maybe Frank as well. Um, so thank you, everyone, for the presentations. This might be a simple question, but um, when we talk about German memory and kind of this difference between national and transnational memory in our history cultures, kind of I'm thinking about the end of the Cold War and then the reunification of Germany and kind of a big debate then was uh, I think the British and some other people were hesitant about the reunification of Germany, about what that might imply for European security politics. And it seems now we've kind of come to a shift in that why isn't Germany doing more? And so I don't know if this hesitation on the German side is at all associated with this, and then kind of how transnational memory just kind of forgets this or has completely gotten over it. So yeah, thanks. My turn, yeah. Um, yeah, I want to thank all the presenters. I think that one of the sort of major lies that connects all the presentation is about this like, uh, very sophisticated interplay between several players being like some Eastern Central European state on one hand and then Russia and the West and this sort of like tripartite structure of this entire historical drama and uh, I would probably address this question to Gabor. I really liked your presentation how, uh, how specific historical memories could turn into empty signifiers. But I wonder, it made me think about this famous essay by Milan Kundera, the, the Kidnapped West and the Tragedy of Central Europe, where he says he explicitly builds it around the, the 1956 in, in Hungary, saying that the real tragedy of Central Europe is not it's, that it's being surprised by the Soviets, but it's basically that it's being ignored by the West, and even more so that it is longing for Europe which is non-existent, sort of, that they're fighting for ideals that are never present, that in fact Europe has sold its soul and, and, and all these motifs. So I wonder if it's just a Czech interpretation or it was also present in Hungary itself, this sort of, this betrayal of the West which is not true to its own ideals. Thank you. So any other questions from the audience? If not, I would ask our speakers to answer them, but I, maybe I can't help myself not to ask a question uh, to Burkhardt about German me memory, because it was, in fact, at the beginning when I started to think about such a conference. So the mass media were full of uh, statements about German memory in spring of this year. Germans feel guilty for what German soldiers did in Soviet Union during Second World War. It means in Russia. And that's why the German government doesn't feel to be too much involved in the war. 
my suspicion was, isn't there another layer of German memory and <coughs> so, the, so the memory of military disaster during Second World War, what happened on the Eastern Front and that the Russian army is invincible. It was in fact, uh, in a way, it came to my mind again last week, not only Czech media reported about uh, comments made by Boris Johnson in his interview about the position of different European governments when the war started or before the war started. And he said about German government that in fact German government expected that the war will be over within a few days. And maybe even hoped that the war will be over even a few days. And so clearly there is again behind this is memory in my opinion about the invincible Russian army and about the terrible force of Russian army, which fortunately enough proved to be not to be true. But don't you think that this this is definitely not the decisive factor in German politics towards Russian aggression against Ukraine, but, but the German memory of irresistible Russian military force didn't it play any role? Yes, so please, maybe let's start with, with you. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, well, maybe I tried first to, to, to answer then the, the question of, of Bradley and then I tried to answer yours, um, Aldrich. Well, the, the British influence um, or after um, peaceful revolution or the, the German reunification, that's right. I think the, the Red two nations or two leaders who were very critical in Europe and towards the German unif unification was Margaret Thatcher but also François Mitterrand. Uh, the later ones was somehow satisfied um, with court's promise towards European, let's say, uh, role and um, the imposition of, of the euro and that Cole promised that he would be uh, yeah, it, it, it European like uh, policy and uh, then Mitterrand to some extent uh, agreed to the German reunification. Differently indeed was it with Margaret Thatcher. Um, I guess for two reasons. One, um, Great Britain is still very, I would say, obsessed by the victory of the Second World War. And, and the, the main <laughs> enemy was then, then uh, the German Reich. And to some extent, this is still an important factor in the British memory, I would say. And you, you even can find it decades ago. I was struck by the fact that some submarine commanders uh, who died in the age of 80s or 90s, German submarine commanders, there were some uh, memory notes in English newspapers still in the 90s and that said what it has to do uh, with what's or what's wrong with British um, collective memory and another point might be that Margaret Thatcher was really obsessed by their own position in Europe because her uh, John Major was much more softly um, against the Europe reunification, uh, German reunification and, and Germany's role in Europe. Um, yeah. Um, and coming back to your question with uh, the guilt of the past um, connecting with Russia or the Soviet Union, there is certainly a point uh, that it's part of a German culture of memory that we feel obliged then to Russia because we invaded uh, the Soviet Union then, um, in June 1941 and there was these fierce battles over years and a lot of uh, 
German soldiers were kept in captivity uh, for years. And it's certainly influenced until today the, the German memory culture, neglecting the fact that uh, most of the soldiers of the Red Army came from the Ukraine and Belarusia. So that's the blind eye which we now try to correct. And for example, we have an, a museum which was called uh, until recently the German Russian Museum. That was a museum where the capitulation was signed and now the museum was renamed. Just to give you an example that we are still in a changing memory culture and, and but you also have, your question was more deeply i would say there is still there's still some russell or a lot of russell files in germany who are uh, try to to legitimate um, well, using the German past and, and, and to speak about a certain special relationship between Russia and Germany, but that's also a kind of uh, supervision and neglecting small countries because the Germans um, regard themselves as a relatively big country in Europe and still have this tendency to, well, to respect uh, Russian leadership and Russian at all. Um, and there is unfortunately still a kind of split between East Germans and West Germans, but it's another debate or another question. Okay. I have my own, okay. Uh, so, um, Valeria, thank you very much for this uh, question. I think uh, that this is a very important one, and I try to answer you very briefly. Uh, so, the lack of uh, Western assistance, um, I believe, also belongs to the multidimensional um, picture of the 1956 revolution, uh, and it was definitely uh, was present in the post 1956 era. So, during the Qadarist time times and um, it was uh, one of the most important elements of the Qadarist uh, propaganda uh, since uh, uh, according to this uh, counter-revolutionary narrative um, um, Radio Free Europe was accused first of all uh, to encourage uh, these freedom fighters uh, to continue the fight uh, on the streets of Budapest, even in the moments when uh, it was uh, already obvious that there is no hope. Uh, and this way, like underlying uh, the lack of Western assistance uh, and a kind of betrayal of, um, of uh, Western powers, and through this suggesting that there is no other alternative, just communism, which, uh, which is to say in, in Hungary. Uh, so this is like the post-1956 um, history of uh, of this element, uh, but I think that it's uh, still present in Hungary, um, especially if we speak about um, this general attitude of many people, this disillusion uh, with the West, and it can come hand in hand uh, with um, with this misinterpretation, I believe, uh, or interpretation of this uh, war in Ukraine, that um, this war in Ukraine is not between Ukraine and Russia, but it's uh, between Russia and the United States. Um, and uh, so I think that there is also a kind of um, connection between these narrations and the elements of, of uh, like the Western uh, betrayal. So you are right, and thank you for this question. Oh, I just want to thank you for this uh, comment. Uh, I, I uh, fully agree with you. I will uh, check it because you know it's sometimes a problem when two people write one <laughs> one text, but it's uh, it's uh, it's clear you are right. Thank you very much. And uh, I have another idea. It's uh, it it could be maybe again a new point to check how my subject of research, our politician, talk about the uh, name of the war. Thank you. David Svoboda, would you like to add anything? Uh, I know it's 
Uh, there's a question, you know, uh, I'm fully at your uh, disposal, yeah. Uh, but uh, now I'm quite satisfied. Okay, so if there are no other questions from the audience, what remains is to close the conference, or to conclude the conference, which I'm going to do from over there. Usually there is someone who provides the audience with concluding remarks, but to my opinion, there is the only one person worldwide who can do it, and this is Tom Blanton from Washington, and we didn't invite him, so we will not have concluding remarks in proper sense of word. Uh, I, I made a lot of notes, but fortunately for you, I'm completely lost in those notes, so I will not try to reconstruct the meaning of conference and so on. There was a lot of questions at the beginning. Some of them were answered. For instance, uh, I was really interested in Hungarian memory and the reaction of Hungary on the Russian aggression against Ukraine. And Gabor explained to us that not only memory of the past could have an impact on the politics of the present, but politics of the present could try to change the memory of the past. Uh, we, yesterday, uh, Jan Rudel explained us another puzzle, how it was possible, the Ukrainian-Polish reconciliation in a world with such a very different memories of the past and with a very painful memory of the past on, on both sides. Uh, now, on my last question, Burkhardt explained something about the German memory, so, so some, some answers, but even more questions, new questions. So I really, really uh, <clears throat> consider very, very important and useful the, the term of retrotopical practices introduced by Miloš Řeznik yesterday. And I would, uh, I would really be interested, is there any link between what I would call soft retrotopical practices, like removal of statues Lenin from Helsinki or Pushkin from Kiev? Konya from Prague or, or generally from Richmond, I don't know, and, and hard retrotopical practices like is an attempt to remove, let's say, Ukraine from the map of Europe, so to put it in a, in a simple way. So is there a link between this or, or is this soft retrotopical practices something which we can live with and, and, and so on? Uh, <clears throat> I think the most important message of this conference and what we were speaking about during class two days is something about <coughs> Russian use of historical arguments. Look, during the new, uh, no, new, during the old Cold War, there was a slogan, Soviet Union is a upper volta with missiles. Sorry for this is politically not correct towards Burkina Faso, but I'm just quoting that. I would say now Russia is a 19th century imperialist country driven by radical nationalism. And this is maybe even more dangerous than this, and, and with missiles still, unfortunately with missiles. And so, <clears throat> and Alexei Kamensky and, and also Valeria Koroblova explained us how this historical narrative or meta-historical narrative is there and based on one exist for forever lasting event, great patriotic war and its use. I think we have to understand that our task is, not our historians, but generally our Europeans, how to say it, is not to face this with another opposite narrative of history. Much better would be to deconstruct that narrative of history, as again Valeria Korablova explained to us, and to keep with diverse memories. Today, Reka Sharkozy very persuasively explained to us or showed us how it is possible that one historical phenomenon could leave very different races in, in historical memory within one country, and to have this diary, diversity within certain countries and among countries, I think is important thing, okay, we should keep it. Yesterday, maybe some, maybe 
maybe I didn't understand it correctly, but someone, uh, someone proposed that perhaps some aspects of Polish-Ukraine memory should be forgotten for this moment or for this situation. I don't know. Look, uh, Jan Riedel remind us, reminded us yesterday that uh, really not very nice movie, Volinia, about the massacres in, in Volinia 43-44. I do remember that there was a, as a statement which introduced that movie and it, it, it said the victims of crisis of the victims of interwar Eastern Poland were killed twice, first by X, so they were murdered by Ukrainian nationalists, and then by silence. And this second murder is even more painful. So should we kill them for the third time? I don't think so. We simply have to live with, with different histories and with different historical memories, and we must not to try to use them as a weapon or as an argument for politics of the present. I think that's, and there is our responsibility as historians, and that, that perhaps we could, uh, it seems to me, uh, understand as a message of this conference, and uh, let's hope we will do it uh, in, the, in the future. So, time is over. I would like again to thank anyone, so people who helped us to organize it, Marketa Devata and David Weber, our student assistants, uh, our partner organizations, again, for their organizational and financial uh, effort, which uh, made this conference uh, possible for, to get the institute for its hospitality, and especially to you, participants of the conference. Uh, I hope you will share my opinion that it was a success. I hope so, yeah. So thank you again. And so this is the real end. <laughs>